Chapter twenty five of A Mama's Wife by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five. Next morning, Kate was duly repentant and begged Dick to forgive her for all she had said and done. She told him that she loved him better than anything in the world, and she persuaded him that if she had taken a drop too much, it was owing to jealousy and not to any liking for the drink itself. Dick adopted the theory willingly. Every man is reluctant to believe that his wife is a drunkard, and deceived by the credulity with which he had accepted the excuse, Kate resolved to conquer her jealousy, and if she could not conquer it, she would endure it. Never would she seek escape from it through spirit again. And had she remained in Manchester, or had she even been placed in surroundings that would have rendered the existence of a fixed set of principles possible, she might have cured herself of her vice, but before two months her engagement at the Prince's came to an end, and Dick's at the Royal very soon followed. They then passed into other companies, the first of which dealt with Shakespearean revivals. Dick played Don John successfully in Much Ado About Nothing, the Ghost in Hamlet, the Friar in Romeo and Juliet. Kate, on her side, represented with a fair amount of success a series of second parts, such as Rosalind in Romeo, Bianca in Othello, Sweet Anne Page in The Merry Wives. It is true there were times when her behaviour was not all that could be desired, sometimes from jealousy, sometimes from drink, generally from a mixture of the two. But on the whole she managed very cleverly, and it was not more than whispered, and always with a good-natured giggle, that Mrs. Lennox was not averse to a glass. From the Shakespearean they went to join a dramatic company, where houses were blown up and ships sank amid thunder and lightning. Dick played a desperate villain and Kate a virtuous parlour-maid, until one night, having surprised him in the act of kissing the manager's wife, she ran off to the nearest pub and did not return until she was horribly intoxicated and staggered onto the stage, calling him the vilest names, accusing him at the same time of adultery and pointing out the manager's wife as his paramour. There were shrieks and hysterics, and Dick had great difficulty in proving his innocence to the angry impresario. He spoke of his honour and a duel, but as the lady in question was starring, the benefit of the doubt had to be granted her, and on these grounds the matter was hushed up. But after so disgraceful a scandal, it was impossible for the Lennoxes to remain in the company. Dick was very much cut up about it, and without even claiming his week's salary, he and his wife packed up their baskets and boxes and returned to Manchester and there he entered into a quantity of speculations, of the character of which she had not the least idea. All she knew was that she never saw him from one end of the day to the other. He was out of the place at ten o'clock in the morning, and never returned before twelve at night. These hours of idleness and solitude were hard to bear, and Kate begged of Dick to get her an engagement but he was afraid of another shameful scene, and always gave her the same answer, that he had as yet heard of nothing, but as soon as he did he would let her know. She didn't believe him, but she had to submit, for she could never muster up courage to go and look for anything herself, and the long summer days passed wearily in reading the accounts of the new companies and the new pieces produced. This sedentary life, and the effects of the brandy, which she could now no longer do without, soon began to tell upon her health, and the rich olive complexion began to fade to sickly yellow. Even Dick noticed that she was not looking well. He said she required a change of air, and a few days after he burst into the room and told her gaily that he had just arranged a tour to go round the coast of England and play little comic sketches and operettas at the pier theatres. This was good news, and the next few days were fully occupied in trying over music, making up their wardrobes, and telegraphing to London for the different books from which they would make their selections. A young man whom Dick had heard singing in a public house proved a great hit. He wrote his own words, some of which were considered so funny that at Scarborough and Brighton he frequently received a couple of guineas for singing a few songs at private houses after the public entertainment. 
Afterwards, he appeared at the pavilion and, for many years, supplied the axioms and aphorisms that young Toothpick and Crutch was in the habit of using to garnish the baldness of his native speech. For a time, the sea proved very beneficial to Kate's health, but the never-ending surprises and expectations she was exposed to finished by so straining and sharpening her nerves that the stupors, the assuagements of drink, became, as it were, a necessary make-weight. Her love for Dick pressed upon and agonised her. It was like a dagger whose steel was being slowly reddened in the flames of brandy, and in this subtilization of the brain the remotest particles of pain detached themselves until life seemed to her nothing but a burning and unbearable frenzy. She didn't know what she wanted of him, but with a longing that was nearly madness, she desired to possess him wholly. She yearned to bury her poor, aching body, throbbing with the anguish of nerves, in that peaceful hulk of fat, so calm, so invulnerable to pain, marching amid and contented in its sensualities as a gainly bull grazing amid the pastures of a succulent meadow. He was never unkind to her. The soft, sleek manner that had won her remained ever the same, but she would have preferred a blow. It would have been something to have felt the strength of his hand upon her. She wanted an emotion. She longed to be brutalised. She knew when she tortured him with reproaches she was alienating from herself any affection he might still bear for her, but she found it impossible to restrain herself. There seemed to be a devil within her that goaded her until all power of will ceased, and against her will she had to obey its behests. A blow might exorcise this spirit. Were he to strike her to the ground, she thought she might still be saved. But alas, he remained as kind and good-natured as ever, and to disguise her drunkenness she had to exaggerate her jealousy. The two were now mingled so thoroughly in her head that she could scarcely distinguish one from the other. She knew there were women all around him. She could see them ogling him out of the little boxes at the side of the stage. How they could be such beasts she couldn't conceive. They stood for hours behind the scenes waiting for him, and she was told they had come for engagements. Baskets of food, pork pies and tongue came for him. But these she pitched out of the window, and she soundly boxed the ears of one little wretch whom she found loitering about the stage door. Kate was right sometimes in her suspicions, sometimes wrong, but in every case they accentuated the neurosis occasioned by alcohol from which she was suffering. Still, by some extraordinary cunning, she contrived for some time to regulate her drinking so that it should not interfere with business. And on the rare occasions when Dick had to apologise to the public for her non-appearance, she insisted that it was not her fault, and from a mixture of vanity and a wish to conceal his wife's shame from himself, Dick continued to persuade himself that his wife had no real taste for drink, and never touched it except when these infernal fits of jealousy were upon her. But the words that had come into his mind— except when these infernal fits of jealousy are upon her, called up many vivid memories. One especially confounded him. He had seen her frightened across the dressing-room, lest she might fall, glancing from the table to the chair, calculating the distance. It was on his lips to ask her if she didn't feel too ill to appear that day, that perhaps it would be better for him to go before the curtain and apologise to the public— but he had not dared to say anything, and to his astonishment she was able to overcome the influence of the drink, if she had taken any, and he had never heard her sing and dance better. How she had managed it he did not know. All the same, he said, drink will get the upper hand of her, and conquer her if she doesn't make up her mind to conquer it. The day will come when she will not be able to go on the stage." Oh, we'll go on and fall down. Dick shut his eyes to exclude from them the horrible spectacle. She would then be an unmitigated burden on his hands. Not a pleasant prospect, he said to himself. He had now been in the provinces for some years, and had lived down the memory of many disastrous managements. 
He had managed the tour of the Morton and Cox's Opera Company very successfully till the crash came. But it will be the success that will be remembered, and not the crash, when I return to London. Many changes must have happened in town, many new faces and many old faces that absence will make new again. If only Kate were not so jealous. If I could cure her of jealousy, I could cure her of drink. And he thought of all the notices she had had for Claret, for Sir Paulette, for Olivette. He would like to see her play the Duchess. At that moment his thoughts returned to the last time he had seen her, about half an hour ago. The memory was not a pleasant one, and he was glad that he had run out of the house and come down to the pier. And in the silence and solitude of the pier at midday he asked himself again why he should not return to town and take his chance of getting into a new company or being sent out to manage another provincial tour. In London he might be able to persuade his wife to go into a home, and he fell to thinking of the men and women who he had heard had been cured of drunkenness. His thoughts melted into dreams, and then, suddenly passing out of dreams into words, he said, "'She will never consent to go into a home, and if she did, she would only be thinking all the time that I'd put her there so that I might be after another woman.' His thoughts were interrupted by a lancinating pain in his feet, and he withdrew into the shade, and resting the heel of the right boot on the toe of the left, a position that freed him from pain for the time being, he looked around, and seeing everywhere a misted sky filled with an inner radiance, he said, oh, "'Today will be the hottest day we've had yet, and there won't be a dozen people in the theatre. Everybody will be too hot to leave their houses.' There was languor in the incoming wave. "'We shan't have five pounds in the theatre,' he muttered to himself. And catching sight of one of the directors, he continued, "'And those fellows won't think of the heat, but we'll put down the falling off in the audience to our performance.' "'Never,' he added after a pause, "'have I seen the pier so empty.' And he wondered who the woman was coming towards him. A tall, gaunt woman of about forty-five, whose striding gait caused a hooped and pleated skirt of green silk surmounted by a bustle to sway like a lime tree in a breeze, wore a bodice open in front with short sleeves, the fag end of some other fashion, but the long, draggled, tailed feather boa belonged to the eighties, as did the Mary Stuart bonnet. Her blackened eyebrows and a thickly painted face attracted Dick's attention from afar, and when she approached nearer he was struck by the dark, brilliant, restless eyes. "'A strange and exalted being,' he said to himself. "'An authoress, perhaps, for he noticed that she carried some papers in her hand. Mm, "'Or a poet,' he added, and prompted by his instinct, he began to see in her somebody that might be turned to account, and before long he was thinking how he might introduce himself to her.' She's forgotten her parasol. I might borrow one for her from the girl at the bar. And the project seeming good to him, he rose, and with a specially large movement of the arm, lifted his hat from his head. You will excuse me, I hope, madam, addressing you, and if I do so, it's because I am in an official capacity here. But may I offer you a parasol? Oh, it's very kind of you she replied, with a smile that lighted up her large mouth, dispersing its ugliness. "'She's got a fine set of teeth,' Dick said to himself, and he answered that he would borrow a parasol for her in the theatre. "'It's very kind of you,' she returned, smiling largely and becomingly upon him. "'It's true I forgot to bring a parasol with me, and the sun is very fierce at this time. It will be kind of you.' and much gratified that his proposal had been so graciously received, he hobbled away in the direction of the theatre, to return a few moments after with the bar-girl's parasol, which he had borrowed, and which he opened and handed to the lady. "'Might I ask,' she said, "'if you're one of the directors of the theatre?' "'No,' he answered. "'I'm an actor.' "'An actor in this theatre?' she replied. "'But they only sing trivial songs and dance in this theatre, 
and you look to me like one of Shakespeare's imaginations. Henry the Eighth, almost any one of the Henrys, King John. Not Romeo, Dick interposed. Perhaps not Romeo. Romeo was but sixteen or seventeen, eighteen at the most. But when you were eighteen... Oh, yes, Dick answered, I was thin enough then. Oh, but you must not disparage yourself. Heroes are not always thin. Hamlet was fat and scant of breath. I can see you as Hamlet, whereas to cast you for Falstaff would be too obvious. I've played Falstaff, Dick replied, but I never could do much with the part. I never saw anyone who could. The lines are very often too highfalutin for the character, and they don't seem to come out no matter who plays it. The critics look on it as the best acting part, but in truth it's the worst. Macduff would fit you. No, Lear, the lady cried. Dick thought he would like to have a shot at the king, and they were soon talking about a Shakespearean theatre devoted to the performance of Shakespearean plays. A theatre, she said, that would devote itself to the representation of all the heroes in the world, those who spoke noble thoughts and performed noble deeds, thought and deed encompassing each other, instead of which we have a thousand theatres devoted to the representations of the fashions of the moment. So I am forced to come here at midday. For at midday there is solitude and sacred silence, or else the clashing of waves. Here at midday I can fancy myself alone with my heroes. And who are your heroes, may I ask? said Dick. Oh, many are in Shakespeare, she answered, and many are here in this manuscript. The heroes of the ancient world, when men were nearer to the gods than they are now. For men, she added, in my belief are not moving towards the Godhead, but away from it. And who are the heroes that you've written about? Dick asked, and fearing she would enter into too long an explanation, he asked if the manuscript she held in her hand was a play. No, a poem, she answered. I'm studying it for recitation, one I'm going to recite after my lecture at the Working Men's Club. And the subject of my lecture is the inherent nobility of man and the necessity of man-worship. Women have turned from men and are occupied now with their own aspirations, losing sight thereby of the ideal that God gave them. My poem is a sort of abstract, an epitome, a compendium of the lecture itself. Dick did not understand, but the fact that a lady was going in for recitation argued that she was interested in theatricals, and with his ears pricked like a hound who has got wind of something, he said with a sweet smile that showed a whole row of white teeth, "'Being an actor myself, I will take the liberty of asking you to allow me to look at your poem, and perhaps if you're studying for recitation I may be of use to you.' "'Of the very greatest use,' the lady answered, and handed him her manuscript. "'One of a set of classical cartoons,' she added. Oh, "'Humanity in large lines,' he replied. "'How quickly you understand,' she rapped out. "'Removed altogether from the tea-table in subject and in metre. "'What have you got to say, my hero, to me about my rendering of these lines?' The offspring of Neptune and Terra, daughters of earth and ocean, dowered with fair faces of woman, capping the bodies of vultures, armed with sharp, keen talons, crushing and rending and slaying, blackening and blasting, defiling, spoiling the meats of all banquets, plundering, perplexing, pursuing, cursing the lives of our heroes, ever the harpier flourish, just as a triumph of evil. Oh, hardly anything, and yet if I may venture a criticism, would you mind passing your manuscript on to me for a moment? May I suggest an emendation that will render the recitation more easy and more effective? Oh, certainly you may. 
Then, Dick continued, I would drop the words, just as a triumph of evil, and run on, flourish from childhood, ensnaring the noble, the brave, and the loyal, spreading their nets for destruction. Harpie flourish in ballrooms, breathing fierce breath that is poison over the promise of manhood, over the faith and the love light that glows in the hearts of our bravest for all of their kind that is weaker. All that follows, Dick added, will be recited without emphasis until you come to these two magnificent lines. Harpie stand by our altars, Harpie sit by our hearthstones, Harpie suckle our children, Harpie ravish our nation, etc. Dick finished with a grand gesture. I think you're right. Yes, I understand that a point can be given to these verses that I had not thought of before. I hope my poem touched a chord in your heart. Do you approve of my manner of writing the hexameters? Oh, I think the idea very fine, but, um, but, if you will permit me? Oh, certainly. Well, there are questions of elocution that I would like to speak to you about. I've to run away now, but we're sure to meet again. I'm on the pier every day at noon, or you'll find me in my hotel at five. I hope you'll come, for I should like to avail myself of your instruction. Oh, thank you. I hope to have the pleasure of calling upon you tomorrow afternoon. Goodbye. You don't know my name, she cried after him. Oh, heroes are full of forgetfulness, and naturally. But in this tea-table world we can't get on without names and addresses. Will you take my card? Dick took the card, thanked her, and turned suddenly away. Like a man filled with disquiet, the lady said, and she watched the burly actor hurrying up the pier. Is this woman coming to meet him? she asked herself, as Dick hurried away still faster, for in the distance the woman coming down the pier seemed to him like his wife, and if Kate had caught him talking to a woman on the pier, all chance of doing any business with his new acquaintance would be at an end. But the woman who had just passed him by was not Kate, and the thought crossed his mind that he might return to his new acquaintance with safety. But on the whole, it seemed to him better to wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow he would find out all about her. Her name, he said, and taking the card out of his pocket, he read, Mrs. Forrest, Mother Superior of the Yarmouth Convent, Alexandra Hotel, Hastings. Mother Superior of a convent? I should never have thought it. But if she is a nun, why isn't she in a habit? Classical cartoons and nunneries. I think this time I've hit upon a strange specimen, one of the strangest I've ever met, which is saying a great deal, for I've met with a good few in my time. It'll be better to tear up her card, for if Kate should find it. And then, dismissing Mrs. Forrest from his mind, he wondered if he should find Kate drunk or sober. Quite sober, he said to himself, as soon as he crossed the threshold, and in the best of humours his wife greeted him, and taking his arm they went down to the pier and gave an entertainment that was appreciated by a fairly large audience. Hmm, why didn't she ask me to come to her at five today? he asked himself as he returned home with his wife. She may fall through my fingers. And he would have gone straight away to Mrs. Forrest if he had been able to rid himself of Kate. "'You'll take me out to tea, Dick,' she said, and to keep her sober he took her to tea. For the nonce, Kate drunk would have suited him better than Kate sober, and he dared not go down to the pier next morning in search of Mrs. Forrest, it being more than likely that Kate might take it into her head to sun herself on the pier. So he decided to wait. The pier was too dangerous.' If he weren't interrupted by Kate, the directors might see them together, and they might know Mrs. Forrest and tell her that he was a married man. No, he'd just keep his appointment with her at five. But to get rid of Kate required a deep plan. It was laid and succeeded, and at five he arrived at the Alexandra Hotel. 
Is Mrs. Forrest in? The hall porter told the page boy to take Mr. Lennox up to Mrs. Forrest's rooms. All this smells money, Dick said to himself in the lift. The page boy threw open the door, and after walking through a long corridor, the boy knocked at a door, and Dick walked into a red twilight in which he caught sight of a green dress in a distant corner. I hope you are not one of those people who require the glare of the sun always. I like the sun in its proper place out of doors. And while thinking an appropriate answer, Dick strove to find his way through the numerous pieces of furniture littered over the carpet. Come and sit on the sofa beside me. Oh, if you'll allow me, he answered, I will sit in this armchair. I shall be able to devote myself more completely to the hearing of your poem. It was not polite to refuse to sit beside the lady, but Dick contrived to convey that her presence would trouble his intellectual enjoyment, and the slight displeasure which the refusal had caused vanished out of the painted face. This first success almost succeeded in screwing up Dick's courage to the point of asking her if he might remove the flower vase that stood on the cabinet behind him, but he did not dare, and at every moment he seemed to recognise a new scent. An odour of burning pastilles drifted from a distant corner into a zone of patchouli in which the lady seemed to have encircled herself and which her every movement seemed to spread in more and more violent flavours, till Dick began to think he wouldn't be able to hold out till the end of the lady's narrative. Patchouli always gave him a headache, but the word opera restored him to himself, and with lips quivering like a cat watching a sparrow, he heard that the subject of her opera was derived from her own life and telling him that it could not be understood without a relation of the events that had given it birth, she drew her legs up on the sofa, and leaning her head against the back, commenced in a low, cooing, but not disagreeable voice, to tell of her first love adventure. I might almost call my departure for Bulgaria some ten years ago a spiritual adventure, she said. The departure for Bulgaria seemed full of interest, but from Dick's point of view the leading up to the departure was unduly prolonged, and he found it difficult to listen with any show of interest to Mrs. Forrest's assurances that until she met the Bulgarian she had thought that babies were found in parsley beds or under gooseberry bushes, and this innocence of mind was so inherent in her that the Bulgarian had not succeeded altogether in robbing her of it. "'Nor, indeed, did he ever attempt to do so,' she continued. "'Our friendship was founded purely on the intellect.' This admission was a disappointment to Dick, who had looked forward to the story of a novel love adventure which might easily be worked into a comic opera, Bulgaria offering a suitable background. With many pretty smiles he tried to lead the lady into the real story of her past— but Mrs. Forrest insisted so well that he was fain to believe that there had been no past in her life suitable to a comic opera. Her Bulgarian adventure had been animated by love of liberty and a noble desire to free an oppressed race from the ignoble rule of the Turks. Massacres, she said, full of nameless horrors. Dick would have liked her to name these horrors, but before he could ask her to do so, she was telling him of the instinct in every woman to mother something. The Bulgarians had appealed to her sympathies, and she had helped to bring about their liberation by her poetry. In three years she had learnt the language and had composed two volumes of poems in it. "'I've looked out copies of my Bulgarian poems for you.' and she leaned over the edge of the sofa towards a small table. The movement disarranged her skirt, and Dick's eyes were regaled by the show of a thick, shapeless leg. Doubtless swarthy, he said to himself. The title of the first volume, she said, handing him the books, is Songs of a Stranger. My friend the Bulgarian, and she mentioned an unpronounceable name, contributed a preface. The second volume is entitled New Songs by the Stranger. You will find a translation appended to each. 
Deke promised that he would read the poems as soon as he got home, and begged Mrs. Forrest to proceed with her interesting story of the war in which she had lost her great friend, her spiritual adventure, as she called him. From Bulgaria she had set forth on a long journey, visiting many parts of China, returning home full of love for Eastern civilization and regret that Western influence would soon make an end of it. But, she said, when I think of my own life, my narrative seems but a faint echo of it all. Only a fragment of it appears, whereas if I could tell the whole of it... But Dick inclined to the belief that her genius was dramatic rather than narrative, and to bring the autobiography to an end, he asked her how she had come to be the mother superior of the Yarmouth convent. "'If I can only get her to cut the cackle and get to the osses,' he said to himself. But this was not easy to do. Mrs. Forrest had to relate her socialistic adventures, her engagement to Edgar Horsley. For three years, she said, I was engaged to him, and at the end of this time it seemed to me that we must come to an understanding. He was talking of going to Jamaica, and to go to Jamaica with him we would have to be married. So I went down to where he was staying in the country, a cottage in Somersetshire, at the end of a very pretty lane. Oh, good God, if she's going to describe the landscape to me said Dick to himself. But Mrs. Forrest had no eye for the appearance of trees showing against the sky, and she was quickly at the cottage door, which was opened to her, she said, by a suspicious-looking woman, who said, "'I think I've heard of you. Mr. Horsley is out, but you can come in and wait.' And in about half an hour he came in and introduced me to the woman who had opened the door to me. Isabel is all that I can remember of her name. Isabel, he said, has been living with me for the last ten years, but if you like to come with us to Jamaica, you can join us. This seemed to me an inacceptable proposition. What you propose to me, I said, is unthinkable, and I left the house and have not seen or heard of Mr. Edgar Horsley since. I've looked at water. I've looked at poison, and I've looked at daggers. Dick asked her why she had meditated suicide, and she answered, Oh, was not such an end to a three years engagement sufficient to inspire in any woman a thought of suicide? And I'm very exceptional. A great deal of Mrs. Forrest's life had been unfolded, the only thing that remained in obscurity was how she had come to be the mother superior of the Yarmouth convent, and to make that plain, she said it would be necessary to tell the story of her conversion to the Catholic faith. Oh, but that was after the convent. The convent was intended for the reformation of dipsomaniacs, female drunkards, she said. But it was afterwards that I became a Roman Catholic— Dick had no wish to hear what dogma it was that had tempted her, but it amused him as he returned home to think of all the strange things that Mrs. Forrest had told him. One thing especially amused him, that her real interest in Catholicism was the confessional. "'How one does get back to oneself in all these things,' he muttered, as he panted up the hot, steep road. "'A convent for the reformation of female drunkards?' he repeated. "'It's very strange. She can't know anything about my wife. "'A strange woman,' he continued, and fell to thinking if all she had told him was the truth, "'or if it was one of those stories that people imagine about themselves, "'and imagine so vividly that after a few years they begin to believe "'that everything they have told has befallen them.' He pulled the books from his pocket. They were evidently written in a strange language, but there were people who could learn languages and could do nothing else. Her Bulgarian poetry could not be better than her English, and he knew what that was like. I suppose as soon as she hears I'm married, and she's sure to find out sooner or later, she'll be off on some other back. But is this altogether sure?' 
He had not walked many steps before he remembered that the lecture she was giving at the working men's club was on the chastity of the marriage state. Moreover, she had admitted to him that the Bulgarian adventure was a spiritual one. I should say she was a woman with a big temperament which must have been worth gratifying when she went away with that Bulgarian. I wouldn't have minded being in his skin. She hasn't forgotten that she was once a beautiful girl. That's the worst of it. She hasn't forgotten. And Dick remembered that at parting she was a little demonstrative, saying to him on the staircase, But we aren't parting for long. You will be here tomorrow at my door at the same hour. End of chapter 25《Chapter Twenty Six of A Mama's Wife by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Six. The appointment was for five o'clock, and Kate would have liked to remain on the pier with Dick enjoying the summer evening, but he seemed so intent on returning to their lodging that she did not like to oppose his wishes, and she allowed herself to be led all the way up the dusty town to their close, hot rooms that she might try over Fredegonde's music. That he should wish to hear her voice again in this music flattered her, but she rose from the piano, her face aflame, when he began to mention an appointment. "'It's too bad of you, Dick, to bring me home and then remember an appointment.' Dick overflowed with mellifluous excuses which did not seem to allay Kate's anger, and as he hurried down the street it occurred to him that he might have thought of a better reason than Fredegonde for bringing her home. However this might be, his thoughts were now with Montgomery and Mrs. Forrest rather than with Kate, and it was not till he drew the latch-key from his pocket that Kate's singing of the waltz returned to him. He ascended the stairs, singing it. I think it will work out all right. What will work out all right? You're an hour later than you said you'd be. Oh, never mind about the hour, he answered, and began to weave a story about his meeting with a pal from London as he was leaving the pier the other day. He hadn't spoken to her about it before, not caring to do so until something definite had happened. What has happened? Kate asked. And Dick, his face aglow, related how the pal had spoken of a great revival of interesting comic opera, especially in French music, and that many city men with plenty of money were on the lookout for somebody who knew how to produce this class of work, and was in sympathy with the Follies dramatique tradition. Kate, who believed everything that Dick told her, listened with a heightened temperature. At Margate, the admirer of Hervé's music became an American, who wished to see Gilles Perique, Trône d'Ecosse, Le Petit Faust, Loy Crevé, and Marguerite de Navarre, reproduced as they had been produced under the composer's direction when Dick was stage manager at that theatre. The American was interested in Hervé, for he not only wrote the music but also the words of his operas, Hervé was, therefore, the Wagner of light comic opera, and if the new venture received sufficient support from the public, Dick would like to add other works by Hervé. La Belle Poule, L'Ousade Percuté, and having puzzled Kate with many titles and an imaginary biography of this musical American, he fell to telling her of Blanche d'Antigny, singing all the little tunes he could remember and branching off into an account of Le Canard à Toibec. This last opera was not by Hervé, but the American liked it and might be persuaded to produce it later on. It contained a part, he said, in which Kate would succeed in establishing herself one of London's favourites. But his praise of her singing and acting set her wondering if he were gulling her once more, or if he still believed in her. It might be that her continued sobriety had reawakened his old love for her, and she remembered suddenly that she had never really cared for drink, and never would have touched drink if Dick hadn't driven her mad with jealousy. 
and the fact that her voice had returned to her helped her to believe that Dick was sincere when he told her that she would be a better Fredegong than Blanche d'Antigny, who created the part originally. Montgomery endorsed this view one evening. He refused to take no for an answer. She must sing the score through with him, and several times he stopped playing, and looking up into her face, he told her he had never known a voice to improve so rapidly and so suddenly. Dick nodded his acquiescence in Montgomery's opinion, and hoped there would be no more need to tell Kate lies once she was settled in a lodging behind the cattle market. But in this he was mistaken, for in London the need to keep up the fiction of Hervé's American admirer was more necessary than at Margate. Dick had to relate his different quests every evening. He had been after the Lyceum, but was unable to get an answer from the lessee. He hoped to get one next week, and when next week came, he spoke about the royalty and the Adelphi and the Haymarket, neglecting, however, to mention the theatre in which he hoped to produce Laura's opera. The large stage of the Lyceum would be excellently well suited, he said, for a fine production of Chilperic, and he besought Kate to apply herself to the study of the part of Fredegonde. His imagination led him into dreams of an English company going over to Paris with all Hervé's works, and Kate obliterating the Blanche d'Antigny tradition. Kate listened delighted, discovering in Dick's praise of her singing a hope that his love of her had survived the many tribulations it had been through, and while listening she vowed she would never touch drink again. Nor did her happiness vanish till morning, till she saw him struggling into his greatcoat and foresaw the long dividing hours. But he had said so many kind things overnight that she was behoven to stifle complaint and bore with her loneliness all day long, refusing food, for without Dick's presence food had no pleasure for her, however hungry she might be. She would wait contented hour after hour if she could have him to herself when he returned. But sometimes he would bring back a friend with him, and the pair would sit up talking of women and their aptitudes in different parts. As none of them were known personally to Kate, the names they mentioned suggested only new causes for jealousy, and the thought that Dick was living among all these women while she was hidden away in this lodging from night till morning, from morning till night, maddened her. It seemed to her that having been out all day, Dick might at least reserve his evenings for her, and one night she showed the man he had brought back to supper plainly that his absence would, so far as she was concerned, have been preferable to his company. "'I wouldn't have come back,' he said, "'only Dick insisted.' And interrupting his regrets that she did not like him, she said, "'It isn't that I don't like you, but you're used to women who aren't in love with their husbands, and I'm in love with mine.' The friend repeated Kate's words to Dick, who said he hadn't a moment till the cast of the new piece was settled, and a few nights later he brought back some music which he said he would like her to try over. "'But it's manuscript, Dick. Why don't you bring home the printed score?' The lie that came to his lips was that the score of Trone d'Ecosse had never been printed, and this seeming to her very unlikely, she said she didn't care whether it had or hadn't, but was tired of living in Islington, and would like to see something of the London of which she had heard so much. "'I've been in London all my life,' Dick said, "'and I haven't been to the Tower or to St. Paul's. However, dear, if you'd like to see them, we'll visit all these places together, as soon as Chilperic is produced.' With this promise he consoled her in a measure, and she watched Dick depart, and then took up a novel and read it till she could read no longer. She then went out for a little walk, but soon returned, finding it wearisome to be always asking the way. So forlorn and lost did she seem, that even the fat landlady, the mother of the ten children who clattered about the head of the kitchen staircase, took pity upon her, and told her the number of the bus that would bring her to the British Museum, assuring her that she would find a great deal there to distract her attention. It did not matter to her where she went if Dick wasn't with her. Without Dick all places were the same to her, 
and the British Museum would do as well as any other place. She must go somewhere, and the British Museum would do as well as the Tower or St. Paul's. There were things to be seen, and she didn't mind what she saw as long as she saw something new. She couldn't look any longer at the two pictures on the walls, with the stream and against the stream, the wax fruit, the mahogany sideboard, the dingy furniture and the torn curtains, and of all she must get out of hearing of the children and the surly landlady, who a few minutes ago was less surly and had told her of the British Museum and all the wonderful things that were to be seen there. But she hadn't the bus fare, and didn't like to ask the landlady for a few pence. As long as she hadn't any money she was out of temptation, and it was by her own wish that Dick had left her without money. As she walked to and fro she caught sight of his clothes thrown over the back of a chair in the bedroom, and he might have left a few pence in one of his pockets. She searched the trousers. How careless Dick was! Several shillings! One, two, three, four, five, five and sixpence! She'd take sixpence. As she walked out of the bedroom, clinking the coppers, the desire to read his letters fell upon her, and yielding to it she put her hand into the inside pocket of his coat, and drew from it a packet of letters and some papers, manuscripts and poems. "'Now who,' she asked, "'can have been sending him these classical cartoons number four? She read of heroes, the glory of manhood collected along the shores of the terrible river that guards the dominions of Pluto. She knew nothing of Pluto, but recognised the handwriting as a woman's, and the lines, Zeus, the monarch of heaven, clothed in the form of a mortal, kneeling, caressed and caressing, drank from her lips joy and love draughts, caused Kate to dash the manuscript from her. A letter accompanied the poem and read, "'My dear, nothing can be done without you, and if you don't come at once we shall miss getting a theatre this season, and without a theatre we are helpless.' Kate did not need to read any more. The letter left no doubt that Dick was engaged in an intrigue with a woman who had written some play or opera which he was going to produce, and the envelope out of which she had taken the letter bore the direction— Richard Lennox, Esquire, Post Restaurant, Margate. So it was lies all the while at Margate, she said to herself, walking about the room, stopping now and again to stare at some object which she did not see. There was no American, no Chilperic, no Trone Dacos, no Loy Crevet, no La Belle Poule, no Marguerite de Navarre. Lies, lies, nothing but lies. He never intended to produce one of them, or that I should play Freddy Gon. Lies, lies, and the great part in Le Canard à Trois-Bec, which would establish my reputation in London. Lies, he never intended to produce one of these operas, she cried. He shut me up here in this lodging, so that I should be out of the way, while he carried on with what's her name. Her brain at that instant seemed to catch fire, and snatching up some money from the mantelpiece, she rushed out of the house, tumbling over the children as she made her way to the front door without hat or jacket. The sunlight awoke her, and she looked around puzzled, and only just escaped being run over by a passing cart. In front of her was a public house. Drink! She went in and drank till she recovered her reason, and began to lose it again. "'A bottle of gin, please,' she said, and put the money on the counter, and returned to her lodging almost mad with jealousy and rage and thirst for revenge. No, she wouldn't drink any more, for if she were to drink any more she'd not be able to have it out with Dick, and this time she would have it out with him, and no mistake. If he were to kill her it didn't matter, but she would have it out with him.' As she sat by the table, waiting hour after hour for him to return, her whole mind was expressed by the words, I'll have it out with him, and she didn't weary of repeating them, for it seemed to her that they kept her resolution from dying. What she feared most was that his presence might quell her resolution. 
to have it out with him as she was minded she mustn't be drunk nor yet too sober he might bring home a friend with him but that wouldn't stay her hand montgomery too had deceived her dick was rehearsing his opera he had written music for that mrs forrest and this was the end of their friendship many hours went by but they didn't seem long passion gave her patience at last a sound of footsteps caused her to start to her feet it was dick this is going to be an all-night affair he said to himself as soon as he crossed the threshold i hope you didn't wait supper for me his manner was most conciliatory and perhaps it was that conciliatory manner that inflamed her business i suppose i know dem well what your business was i know all about it you and your woman mrs forrest the theatre she's taken for you where you were rehearsing montgomery's opera you cannot deny it she cried mrs forrest is her name and reading in his face certain signs of his culpability her anger increased her teeth were set and her eyes glared dick feared she was going mad and with an instinctive movement he put out his arms to restrain her don't touch me don't touch me she screamed and struck at him with clenched fists and then feeling that her blows were but puny she went for him like a bird of prey all her fingers distended take that and that and that you beast oh, you beast you beast you beast her shrieks rang through the house as she pursued him round the furniture he retreating like a lumbering bull striving to escape from her claws how would you like that she cried as she tore at him with her nails again that'll teach you to go messing about after other women i'll settle you before i've done with you chairs were thrown down the coal scuttle was upset and at last as dick tried to get out of the room kate stumbled against a rosewood cabinet sending one of the green vases with its glass shade crashing to the ground summoning the landlady dick spoke about his wife having had a fit Mm, fit or no fit i hope you'll leave my house to-morrow meanwhile dick answered will you leave my room and he shut the door in the face of the indignant householder kate who had now recovered herself a little poured out a large glass of raw gin and to her surprise dick made no attempt to prevent her drinking it as soon as she drinks herself helpless the better he thought as he went into the bedroom to attend to his wounds the scratches she had given him before their marriage were nothing to these one side of his nose was well-nigh ripped open and there were two big deep gashes running right across his face from the cheekbone to his ear it was very lucky he thought she hadn't had his eye out and it might be as well to go round to the apothecaries and get some vaseline some antiseptic treatment for her nails are poisonous he added and his eyes going round the room caught sight of his clothes in disorder ah oh, she's been at my clothes and he took up the classical cartoons and his letters and put them away into his pocket and went into the sitting-room and tried to explain to his wife that he was going out to see if he could get something from the apothecary to heal the wounds she'd given him kate did not answer she's dead drunk he said and it seemed to him that he couldn't do better than to undress her and put her into bed and when he had done this he lay down upon a sofa hoping that he would wake first and be able to get out of the house without disturbing her leaving word with the landlady that he would come back as soon as his rehearsal was over and make arrangements to leave her house since she didn't wish them to stay any longer he fell asleep thinking that he might find his landlady in a different mood and might persuade her in the morning to allow them to stay on the vase of course should be paid for there was a kindly look in her pleasant country face when she wasn't angry his torn face might win her pity and not wishing to increase his troubles she would probably allow them to stay on if she didn't he'd have to find another lodging that very afternoon which would be unfortunate for his engagements were many as it was he'd have to hasten to keep an appointment which he'd made with mrs forrest in the national gallery she really will have to make some alterations in her second act he said going to the glass 
Kate had clawed him with a vengeance, and he'd have to tell Laura how he came by his torn face. And after some consideration, it seemed to him that it would be well to admit that he had received these wounds in a conflict with a wife who was unfortunately given to drink. It was on these thoughts he fell asleep, and overslept himself, he feared. But Kate was still asleep, and without awakening her, he stole downstairs to visit the landlady in her parlour. But hearing his step, she bounced out of the room, with a view, no doubt, to repeating the warning she'd given him overnight. But the sight of his torn face brought pity into hers, and she said, "'Oh, Mr. Lennox, I'm so sorry for you!' A little sympathetic conversation followed, and Dick went off to meet Laura, whom he recognised in the woman who leaned over the railings between the pillars, seemingly attracted by the view across Trafalgar Square. She still wore her green silk dress, the one he had first seen her in on the pier at Hastings, and the long, draggled feather boa. "'She doesn't spend money on dress,' he thought, as he lifted his hat, with not quite the same ceremonious gesture as usual, for he didn't wish to exhibit his scars yet. "'So here you are, Dick, and I waiting for you on the steps of this gallery, glorious with all the imaginations of the heroes.' "'She hasn't seen the scratches yet,' he said to himself, and turned from the light instinctively, preferring that she should make the discovery indoors rather than out of doors. His wounds would appear less in the gallery than in the open air. "'Why didn't she take a little more trouble with her make-up?' he asked himself, and then reproved himself for describing it as a make-up. "'She's not made up,' he said to himself. "'She's painted.' and he wondered how it was that she could plaster her dark skin so flagrantly with carmine and put her eyebrows so high up in the forehead. Yet the face, he said, is a finely moulded one, and compelling when she forgets her cosmetics. And while Dick regretted that she didn't show more skill with these, he heard her telling him that she would prefer to stop and talk with him in the gallery devoted to the Italian pictures than elsewhere. The sublime conceptions of Raphael raise me above myself. And then, as if afraid that her words would seem vainglorious to Dick, she said, You are always in the same mood, never rising above yourself or sinking below yourself, finding it difficult to understand the pain that those who live mostly in the spiritual plane experience, lest they fall into a lower plane. Oh, not that I regard you, Dick, as a lower plane. But your plane is not mine, and that is why you are so necessary to me, and why perhaps I am so necessary to you, or would be if I am not. Come, let us sit here in front of the Raphael, and talk, since we must, of comic opera. It's a pity we're not talking of the Paco, who have been in my mind all the morning, and she began to recite some verses that she had written. But interrupting herself suddenly, she cried, "'Dick, who has been scratching you? How did your face get torn like that? Who's been scratching you?' And Dick answered, "'My wife.' "'Your wife? But you never told me you were married?' "'If I had told you I was married, I would have had to tell you that my wife is a drunkard, and is rapidly drinking herself to death.' A thing that no man likes to speak about. Oh, my poor friend, I didn't mean to reprove you. How did all this come about? It wouldn't do to admit that Kate had discovered Laura's letters and poems in his pockets, and so he told the story of a former experience with his wife, and had barely finished it when Laura begged of him to tell her how he had met his wife. And when he had told her the story, to which she listened solemnly, she answered, and there was the same gravity in her voice as in her face, "'All this comes, my dear Dick, of lewdness. But, Laura, I was faithful to my wife.' "'But she was the wife of another man,' Laura replied. "'Not that that is an insuperable barrier.' But you brought, I fear, lewdness into your conjugal life, and lewdness is fatal to happiness, whether it be indulged within or outside the bonds of wedlock. 
"'I'm sorry,' she said, "'that you had to leave Yarmouth "'before my lecture on the chastity of the marriage state.' "'It wouldn't have mattered,' Dick replied, "'for my wife had taken to drink long "'before we met at Hastings.' "'An answer that darkened Laura's face "'despite all the paint she wore, "'and encouraged Dick to ask her "'if she had never felt the thorns of passion prick her "'when she ran away from her convent school.' She seemed uncertain what answer she should return, but only for a moment, and recovering herself quickly she maintained that it wasn't passion, which is but another name for lewdness, but imagination that had prompted this elopement, and that if she had gone to Bulgaria it was to seek there a nobler life than the one she had left behind. "'It was the immortal that drew me,' she said. "'Even so,' Dick answered. The mortal seems necessary for the immortal, and to provide him with a habitation, a woman must give herself to a man. That, she replied, is one of the penalties entailed by our first parents upon women, but one that is entailed upon a condition that you have not respected, but which I have striven always to respect myself. It would be impossible for me to give myself to a man unless I thought I was going to bear him a child. It was on Dick's lips to remind Laura that a woman can always think she is going to bear a child, but he refrained, it seeming to him that his purpose would be better served by allowing Laura to justify herself as she pleased, and he waited for an opportunity to speak to her about the alteration which he deemed altogether necessary in the second act. But Laura was away on her favourite theme, and in the end he had recourse to his watch. "'My dear Laura, I'm due at rehearsal in ten minutes from now.' "'Well, let's go,' she cried. Oh, "'But, my dear, this is what I've come to tell you, the second act.' And he explained the difficulty which would have to be removed. "'Now, like a dear good girl, will you go home and do this, "'and bring it down to the theatre tomorrow morning at eleven, "'so that we may have an opportunity of going through it together before rehearsal?' In the meantime, Kate lay on her bed, helpless as ever, just as Dick had left her, and it was not until he had given his preliminary instructions to the ballet girls, and Montgomery had struck the first notes of his opening chorus, that a ray of consciousness pierced through the heavy, drunken stupor that pressed upon her brain. With vague movements of hands, she endeavoured to fasten the front of her dress, and with a groan rolled herself out of the light but her efforts to fall back into insensibility were unavailing, and like the dawn that slips and swells through the veils of night, a pale waste of consciousness forced itself upon her. First came the curtains of the bed, then the bare blankness of the wall, and then the great throbbing pain that lay like a lump of lead just above her forehead. Her mouth was clammy as if it were filled with glue, her limbs weak, as if they had been beaten to a pulp by violent blows. She was all pain, but worse still, a black horror of her life crushed and terrified her until she buried her face in the pillow and wept and moaned for mercy. But to remain in bed was impossible. The pallor of the place was intolerable, and sliding her legs over the side, she stood, scarcely able to keep her feet. The room swam as if in a mist. She held her head with clasped hands. The top of it seemed to be lifting off, and it was with much difficulty that she staggered as far as the chest of drawers, where she remained for some minutes trying to recover herself, thinking of what had happened overnight. She'd been drunk, she knew that. But where was Dick? Where had he gone? And what had she said to him? All mental effort was agony, but she had to think, and straining at the threads of memory, she strove to follow one to the end. But it was no use. It soon became hopelessly entangled, and with a low cry she moaned, "'Oh, my poor head, my poor head! I cannot, cannot remember!' But the question, what has become of Dick, still continued to torture her, till, raising her face suddenly from her arm, she hitched up her falling skirts, and, seeing at that moment the bottle on the table, she went into the sitting-room and poured herself out a little, which she mixed with water. "'Just a drop,' she murmured to herself, "'to pull me together. 
It was his fault. Until he put me in a passion, I was all right. Spreading and definite thoughts began to emerge, and for a long time she sat moodily thinking over her wrongs, and as her thoughts wavered they grew softer and more argumentative. She considered the question from all sides, and reasoning with herself was disposed to conclude that it was not all her fault. If she did drink, it was jealousy that drove her to it. Why wasn't he faithful to her who had given up everything for him? Why did he want to be always running after a lot of other women? Where was he now, she'd like to know? As this question appeared in the lens of her thought, she raised her head, and although boozed, the memory of Mrs. Forrest's letters filled her mind. Oh, yes, that's where he's gone to, is it? she murmured to herself. So he's down with his poetess at the Opera Comique, rehearsing Montgomery's opera. A determination to follow him slowly formed itself in her mind, and she managed to map out the course that she would have to pursue. It seemed to her that she was beset with difficulties. To begin with, she did not know where the theatre was, and she could not conceal from herself the fact that she was scarcely in a fit state to take a long walk through the London streets. The spirit, drunk on an empty stomach, had gone to her head. She reeled a little when she walked, and her own incapacity to act maddened her. Oh, good heavens, how her head was splitting! What would she not give to be all right just for a couple of hours? Just long enough to go and tell that beast of a husband of hers what a pig he was, and let the whole theatre know how he was treating his wife. It was he who drove her to drink. Yes, she would go and do this. It was true her head seemed as if it were going to roll off her shoulders, but a good sponging would do it good, and then a bottle or two of soda would put her quite straight, so straight that nobody would know she'd touched a drop. It took Kate about half an hour to drench herself in a basin, and regardless of her dress she let her hair lie dripping on her shoulders. The landlady brought her up the soda water, and seeing what a state her lodger was in, she placed it on the table without a word, without even referring to the notice to quit she had given overnight. And steadying her voice as best she could, Kate asked her to call a cab. Handsome or four-wheeler? For four-wheeler, if you please. Yes, that'll suit you best, said the woman as she went downstairs. You'd perhaps fall out of a hansom. If I were your husband, I'd break every bone in your body. But Kate was now much soberer, and weak and sick she leaned back upon the hard cushions of the clattering cab. Her mouth was full of water, and the shifting angles of the streets produced on her an effect similar to seasickness. London rang in her ears. She could hear a piano tinkling. She saw Dick directing the movements of a line of girls. Then her dream was brought to an end by a gulp. Oh, the fearful nausea! And she did not feel better until flooding her dress and ruining the red velvet seat, all she had drunk came up. But the vomit brought her great relief, and had it not been for a little dizziness and weakness, she would have felt quite right when she arrived at the stage door. In a terrible state of dirt and untidiness she was, surely, but she noticed nothing her mind being now fully occupied in thinking what she should say, first to the stage doorkeeper, and then to her husband. At the corner of which street she dismissed the cab, and this done she did not seem to have courage enough for anything. She felt as if she'd like to sit down on a doorstep and cry. The menacing threats, the bitter upbraiding she had intended, all slipped from her like dreams, and she felt utterly wretched. At that moment, in her little walk up the pavement, she found herself opposite a public house. Something whispered in her ear that, after her sickness, one little nip of brandy was necessary, and would put her straight in a moment. She hesitated, but someone pushed her from behind, and she went in. A four of brandy freshened her up wonderfully, enabling her to think of what she had come to do, and to remember how badly she was being treated. A second drink put light into her eyes and wickedness into her head, and she felt she could and would face the devil. 
"'I'll give it to him. I'll teach him that I'm not to be trodden on,' she said to herself as she strutted manfully towards the stage door, walking on her heels so as to avoid any unsteadiness of gait. The man in the little box was old and feeble. He said he would send her name by the first person going down, but Kate was not in a mood to brook delays, and profiting by his inability to stop her, she banged through the swinging door and commenced the descent of a long flight of steps. Below her was the stage, and between the wings she could see the girls arranged in a semicircle. Dick, with a big staff in hand, stood in front of the footlights, directing the movements of a procession which was being formed. The piano tinkled merrily on the O.P. side. Uh, "'Mr. Chapel, will you be good enough to play the "'Just put this in your pocket chorus over again?' cried Dick, stamping his staff heavily upon the boards. "'Now then, girls, I hear a good deal too much talking going on at the back there. I dare say it's very amusing, but if you try to combine business with pleasure... Now, who did I put in section one? Kate hesitated a moment, arrested by the tones of his voice, and she could not avoid thinking of the time when she used to play claret. Besides, all the well-known faces were there. Our lives move as in circles. No matter what strange vicissitudes we pass through, we generally find ourselves gliding once more into the well-known grooves. And Dick, informing the present company, had naturally fallen back upon the old hands who had travelled with him in the country. They were nearly all there, Mortimer, with his ringlets and his long nasal drawl, stood as usual in the wings, making ill-natured remarks. Dubois strutted as before, and tilting his bishop's hat, explained that he would take no further engagement as a singer. If people would not let him act, they would have to do without him. With her dyed hair tucked neatly away under her bonnet, Miss Leslie smiled as agreeably as ever. Beaumont alone seemed to be missing— and Montgomery, in all the importance of a going-to-be-produced author, strode along up and down the stage, apparently busied in thought, the tails of a new market coat still flapping about his thin legs. And when he appeared in profile against the scenery, he looked, as he had always done, like the flitting shadow thrown by an enormous magic lantern. Kate sullenly watched them, gripping the rail of the staircase tightly. The momentary softening of heart, occasioned by the remembrance of old times, died away in the bitterness of the thought that she who had counted for so much was now pushed into a corner to live forgotten or disdained. Why was she not rehearsing there with them, she asked herself. At once the answer came. Because your husband hates you, because he wants to make love to another woman. Then, like one crazed, she clattered down the iron spiral staircase to the stage. She didn't even hear Mortimer and Dubois cry out as she pushed past. There's Mrs. Lennox! In the middle of the stage, however, she looked around, discountenanced by the silence and the crowd, and hoping to calm her, Dick advised her in whispers to go upstairs to his room. But this was the signal for her to break forth. "'Go up to your room!' she screamed. "'Never, never! "'Do you suppose it's to talk to you that I came here? "'No, I despise you too much. "'I hate you, and I want everyone here to know how you treat me!' "'With a dull stare she examined the circle of girls "'who stood whispering in groups, "'as if she were going to address one in particular, "'and several drew back, frightened. "'Dick attempted to say something.' But it seemed that the very sound of his voice was enough. "'Go away! Go away!' she exclaimed at the top of her voice. "'Go away! Don't touch me! Go to that woman of yours, Mrs. Forrest. Go to her and be damned, you beast. You know she's paying for everything here. You know that you are—' oh, "'For goodness sake, remember what you're saying,' said Dick, interrupting and trembling as if for his life. He cast an anxious glance around to see if the lady in question was within hearing. Fortunately, she was not on the stage. The chorus crowded timidly forward, looking like a school in their walking dresses. The carpenters had ceased to hammer and were peeping down from the flies. Kate stood balancing herself and staring blindly at those who surrounded her. 
Leslie and Montgomery, in the position of old friends, were endeavouring to soothe her, whilst Mortimer and Dubois argued passionately as to when they had seen her drunk for the first time. The first insisted that when she joined them at Hanley she was a bit inebriated. The latter declared that it had begun with the champagne on her wedding day. "'Don't you remember? Dick was married with a scratched face.' Mm, to judge from present appearances said the comedian forcing his words slowly through his nose he's likely to die with one at this sally three supers retired into the wings holding their sides and dubois furious at being outdone in a joke walked away in high dudgeon calling mortimer an unfeeling brute in the meantime the drunken row was waxing more furious at every moment struggling frantically with her friends kate called attention to the sticking plaster on dick's face and declared that she would do for him you see what i gave him last night and he deserved it oh the beast and i'll give him more if you knew all you wouldn't blame me it was he who seduced me who got me to run away from home and he deserts me for other women but he shan't he shan't he shan't i'll kill him first yes i will and nobody will stop me dick listened quite broken with shame for himself and for her as an excuse for the absence of his wife from the theatre he had told mortimer and hayes that london did not agree with her and that she had to spend most of her time at the seaside all had condoled with him and when they were searching London for a second lady, all had agreed that Mrs. Lennox was just the person they wanted for the part. What a pity, they said, she wasn't in town. At the present moment, Dick wished her the other side of Jordan. For all he knew, she might remain screaming at him the whole day. And if Mrs. Forrest came back, well, he didn't know what would happen. The whole game would then be up the spout. Perhaps the best thing to do would be to tell Montgomery of the danger his peace was in. He and Kate had always been friends. She might listen to him. Such were Dick's reflections as he stood bashfully trying to avoid the eyes of his ballet girls. For the life of him he didn't know which way to look. In front of him was a wall of people, whereon certain faces detached themselves. He saw Dubois's mumming mug widening with delight until the grin formed a semicircle round the Jew nose. Mortimer looked on with the mock earnestness of a tortured saint in a stained-glass window. Pity was written on all the girls' faces. All were sorry for Dick, especially a tall woman who forgot herself so completely that she threw her arms about a super and sobbed on his shoulder. But Kate still continued to advance, although held by Montgomery and Miss Leslie. The long black hair hung in disordered masses. Her brown eyes were shot with golden lights. The green tints in her face became, in her excessive pallor, dirty and abominable in colour, and she seemed more like a demon than a woman as her screams echoed through the empty theatre. "'By Jove, we ought to put up Jane Eyre,' said Mortimer. If she were to play the madwoman like that, we'd be sure to draw full houses. I believe you, said Dubois, but at that moment he was interrupted by a violent scream, and suddenly disengaging herself from those who held her, Kate rushed at Dick. With one hand she grappled him by the throat, and before anyone could interfere she succeeded in nearly tearing the shirt from his back. When at length they were separated, she stood staring and panting, every fibre of her being strained with passion. But she did not again burst forth until someone, in a foolish attempt to pacify her, ventured to side with her in her denunciation of her husband. "'How should such as you dare to say a word against him? I will not hear him abused. No, I will not.' I say he is a good man. Yes, yes, he is a good man. The best man that ever lived, she exclaimed, stamping her foot on the boards. The best man that ever lived. I will not hear a word against him. No, I will not. He's my husband. He married me. Yes, he did. I can show you my certificate. And that's more than any one of you can. I know you, a damn lot of hussies. I know you. I was one of you myself. 
"'You think I wasn't? <laughs> ah, well, I can prove it. "'You go and ask Montgomery if I didn't play Sir Paulette all through the country, "'and Clarette, too. "'I should like to see any of you do that, with the exception of Lucy, "'who was always a good friend to me. "'But the rest of you I despise as the dirt under my feet. "'So do you think that I would permit you that I came here to listen to my husband being abused and by such as you?' "'If he has his faults, is accountable to none but me.' "'Here she had to pause for lack of breath, "'and Dick, who had been pursuing his shirt-stud, "'which had rolled into the footlights, "'now drew himself up, "'and in his stage-commanding voice "'declared the rehearsal to be over. "'A few of the girls lingered, "'but they were beckoned away by the others, "'who saw that the present time "'was not suitable for the discussion "'of boots, tights and dressing-rooms. "'There was no one left.' but Leslie, Montgomery, Dick, Kate, and Harding, who, twisting his moustache, watched and listened apparently with the greatest interest. "'Oh, you've no idea what a nice woman she used to be, and is, were it not for that cursed drink,' said Montgomery, with the tears running down his nose. "'You remember her, Leslie, don't you? Isn't what I say true?' "'I never liked a woman so much in my life.' "'Oh, you were a friend of hers, then?' said Harding. "'I should think I was. "'Then you never were... Uh, "'Oh, yes, yes, I understand. "'A little friendship, flavoured with love. "'Yes, yes, wears better, perhaps, than the genuine article. Uh, "'What do you think, Leslie?' "'Not bad,' said the prima donna, "'for people with poor appetites.' "'A kind of diet suitable for Lent, I should think. "'Ah, a title for a short story, or better still for an operetta. "'What do you think, Montgomery? "'Shall I do you a book entitled Lovers in Lent, or A Lover's Lent? "'And Leslie will... "'No, I won't. None of your forty days for me. "'I can't understand how you people can go on talking nonsense "'with a scene so terrible passing under your eyes.' cried the musician, as he pointed to Kate, who was calling after Dick as she staggered in pursuit of him up the stairs towards the stage door. "'Well, what do you want me to do?' "'She'll disgrace him in the street.' "'I can't help that. I never interfere in a love affair, and this is evidently the great passion of a life.' Montgomery cast an indignant glance at the novelist and rushed after his friends, but when he arrived at the stage door, he saw the uselessness of his interference. It was in the narrow street, the heat sweltered between the old houses that leaned and lolled upon the huge black traversing beams like aged women on crutches, and Kate raved against Dick in language that was fearful to hear amid the stage carpenters, the chorus girls, the idlers that a theatre collects, standing with one foot in the gutter where vegetable refuse of all kinds rotted. Her beautiful black hair was now hanging over her shoulders like a mane. Someone had trodden on her dress and nearly torn it from her waist, and in avid curiosity women with dyed hair peeped out of a suspicious-looking tobacco shop. Over the way, stuck under an overhanging window, was an orange stall. The proprietor stood watching, whilst a crowd of vermin-like children ran forward, delighted at the prospect of seeing a woman beaten. Close by, in shirt-sleeves, the pot-boy flung open the public-house door, partly for the purpose of attracting custom, and half with the intention of letting a little air into the bar-room. "'Oh, Kate, I beg of you not to go in there,' said Dick. "'You've had enough. Do come home.' "'Come home!' she shrieked. "'And with you, you beast! "'It was you who seduced me, got me away from my husband!' "'This occasioned a good deal of amusement in the crowd, "'and several voices asked for information. "'And how did he manage to do that, ma'am?' said one. "'With a bottle of gin, what do you think?' cried another. "'There were moments when Dick longed for the earth to open.' but he nevertheless continued to try to prevent Kate from entering the public house. "'I will drink. I will drink. I will drink. And not because I like it, but to spite you. 
because I hate you. When she came out, she appeared to be a little quieted, and Dick tried very hard to persuade her to get into a cab and drive home. But the very sound of his voice, the very sight of him, seemed to excite her, and in a few moments she broke forth into the usual harangue. Several times the temptation to run away became almost irresistible, but with a noble effort of will he forced himself to remain with her, hoping to avoid some part of the ridicule that was being so liberally showered upon him, he besought of her to keep up Drury Lane and not descend into the Strand. "'You don't want to be seen with me. I know you prefer to walk there with Mrs. Forrest. You think I shall disgrace you. Well, come along, then. Look at me here, look at me there, criticise me everywhere. I'm so sweet from head to feet, and most perfect and complete.' "'That's right, old woman. Give us a song. She knows the game,' answered another. Raising his big hat from his head, Dick wiped his face, and as if divining his extreme despair, Kate left off singing and dancing, and the procession proceeded in quiet past several different wine-shops. It was not until they came to Shorts that she declared she was dying of thirst and must have a drink.' Dick forbade the barman to serve her, and brought upon himself the most shocking abuse. Knowing that he would be sure to meet a crowd of his pals at the gaiety bar, he used every endeavour to persuade her to cross the street and get out of the sun. "'Don't bother me with your son,' she exclaimed surlily. And then, as if struck by the meaning of the word, she said, "'But it wasn't a son. It was a daughter. Don't you remember?' Oh. "'Kate, how can you speak so?' "'Speak so? I say it was a daughter, and she died, and you said it was my fault. As you say, everything is my fault, you beast, you venomous beast. Yes, she did die. It was a pity. I could have loved her.' At this moment Dick felt a heavy hand clapped on his shoulder, and turning round he saw a pal of his. "'What? Dick, my boy, a drunken chorus lady, trying to get her home, always up to some charitable action. <laughs> no, she's my wife. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, old chap. You know I didn't mean it. And the man disappeared into the barroom. Yes, I'm his wife, Kate shrieked after him. I got that much right out of him, at least. And I played the serpolette in the cloche. "'Look at me here, look at me there,' she sang, flirting with her abominable skirt, amused by the applause of the rough. "'But I'm going to have a drink here,' she said, suddenly breaking off. "'No, you can't, my good woman,' said the stout guardian at the door. "'And why, why not?' "'That don't matter. You go on, or I'll have to give you in charge.' Kate was not yet so drunk that the words in charge did not frighten her, and she answered humbly enough, "'I'm here with my husband, and as you're so impertinent, I shall go elsewhere.' At the next place they came to, Dick did not protest against her being served, but waited, confident of the result, until she had had her four of gin and came reeling out into his arms. Shaking herself free, she stared at him, and when he was fully recognised, cursed him for his damned interference— she could now scarcely stand straight on her legs, and after staggering a few yards further, fell helplessly on the pavement. Calling a cab, he bundled her into it and drove away. End of chapter 26《Chapter 27 of A Mama's Wife by George Moore This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 Oh, Dick, dear, what did I do yesterday? Oh, do tell me about yesterday. Was I very violent? And those wounds on your face. Oh, I didn't do that. Don't tell me that I did. Dick, oh, Dick, are you going to leave me? I have to attend to my business, Kate. Oh, your business, your business. Mrs. Forrest is your business. You've no other business but her now, and that's what's driving me to drink. 
Oh, Kate, don't begin it again. I've a rehearsal. Oh, yes, the rehearsal of her opera and Montgomery's music. I did think he was my friend. Yet he's putting up her opera to music, and all the while he was setting it, you were telling me lies about Chilperic, saying that I was to play the Fredegond and all the principal parts in the Grey Hervé Festival, but the American... But there was no American. It was cruel of you, Dick, to shut me up here with nobody to speak to. Nothing to do but wait for you hour after hour. And when you come home to hear nothing from you but lies. Nothing but lies. Chill Perrick, Le Petit Faust, Loy Creve, Trone Dacos, Marguerite de Navarre, La Belle Poule and all the music I've learnt, hoping that I would be allowed to sing it. And yet you expect that a woman who's deceived like that can abstain from drink? Why, you drive me to it, Dick. An angel from heaven wouldn't abstain from drink. Away you go in the morning to Mrs. Forrest, to her opera. Oh, but, Kate, there's nothing between me and Mrs. Forrest. She is a very clever woman, and I am doing her opera for her. How are we to live if you come between me and my business? Womanizing is your business, Kate answered suddenly. Well, don't let's argue it, Dick answered. He tied his shoestrings and sought for his hat. So, you're going, she said. And when shall I see you again? I shall try to get home for dinner. What time? Oh, not before eight. Oh, I shall not see you before twelve, she replied, and she experienced a sad sinking of the heart when she heard the door close behind him, a sad sinking that she would have to endure till she heard his latch key, and that would not be for many hours, perhaps not until midnight. She did not know how she would be able to endure all these hours. To sleep some of them away would be the best thing she could do. And with that intention, she drew down the blind and threw herself on the bed, and lay between sleeping and waking till the afternoon. Then, feeling a little better, she rang and asked for a cup of tea. It tasted very insipid, but she gulped it down as best she could, making wry faces and feeling more miserable than ever she had felt before, afraid to look back on yesterday, afraid to look forward on the morrow. She bethought herself of the past— of the happy days when Montgomery used to come and teach her to sing, and her triumphs in the part of Claret. She was quite as successful in Serpolette. People had liked her in Serpolette, and to recall those days more distinctly, she opened a box in which she kept her souvenirs, a withered flower, a broken cigarette holder, two or three old buttons that had fallen from his clothes, and a lock of hair— and it was under these that the prize of prizes lay, a string of false pearls. She liked to run them through her fingers and to see them upon her neck. She still kept the dresses she wore in her two favourite parts, the stockings and the shoes. And having nothing to do, no way of passing the time away, she bethought herself of dressing herself in the apparel of her happy days— presenting, when the servant came up with her dinner, a spectacle that almost caused Emma to drop the dish of cold mutton. "'Oh, Lord, Mrs. Lennox, I thought I see a ghost. You in that white dress. Oh, what lovely clothes! These were the clothes I used to wear when I was on the stage. Oh, but, law, Mum, why aren't you on the stage now?' Kate began to tell her story to the servant girl, who listened till a bell rang, and she said, mm, "'That's Mr. So-and-so ringing for his wife. I must run and see to it. You must excuse me, Mum.' The cold mutton and the damp potatoes did not tempt her appetite, and catching sight of herself in the glass, bitter thoughts of the wrong done to her surged up in her mind. The tiny nostrils dilated and the upper lip contracted, and for ten minutes she stood, her hands grasping nervously at the back of her chair. The canine teeth showed, for the project of revenge was mounting to her head. "'He'll not be back till midnight. All oh, this while is with Leslie and Mrs. Forrest, or oh, some new girl, perhaps. 
Yet when he returns to me, when he's wearied out, he expects to find me sober and pleased to see him. But he shall never see me sober or pleased to see him again. On these words she walked across the room to the fireplace, and putting her hand up the chimney, brought down a bottle of old Tom, and sat moodily sipping gin and water till she heard his key in the lock. <laughs> he's back earlier than I expected, she said. Dick entered in his usual deliberate elephantine way. Kate made no sign till he was seated, and then she asked what the news was. It was clearly out of the question to tell her that he'd been round to tea with one of the girls, to explain how he had wheedled Mrs. Forrest into all sorts of theatrical follies, was likewise not to be thought of as a subject of news, and as to making conversation out of the rest of the day's duties, he really didn't see how he was to do it. Miss Howard had put out the entire procession by not listening to his instructions. Miss Adair, although she was playing the brigand of the ultramarine mountains, had threatened to throw up her part if she were not allowed to wear her diamond earrings. The day had gone in deciding such questions, had passed in drilling those infernal girls, and what interest could there be in going through it all over again? Besides, he never knew how or where he might betray himself, and Kate was so quick in picking up the slightest word and twisting it into extraordinary meanings that he really would prefer to talk about something else. I can't understand how you can have been out all day without having heard something. It's because you want to keep me shut up here and not let me know anything of your goings-on. But I shall go down to the theatre tomorrow and have it out of you. My dear, I assure you that I was at the rehearsal all day. The girls don't know their music yet, and it puts me out in my stage arrangements. I give you my word, that is all I heard or saw today. I've nothing to conceal from you. You're a liar, and you know you are. Blows and shrieks followed. I shall pull that woman's nose off. I know I shall. I Give you my word, dear, that I've been the whole day with Montgomery and Harding, cutting the peace. Oh, cutting the peace, and I should like to know why I'm not in that peace. I suppose it was you who kept me out of it. Oh, you beast. Why did you ever have anything to do with me? It's you who was ruining me. Were it not for you, do you think I should be drinking? Not I. It was all your fault. Dick made no attempt to answer. He was very tired. Kate continued her march up and down the room for some moments in silence, but he could see from the twitching of her face and the swinging of her arms that the storm was bound to burst soon. Presently, she said, "'You go and get me something to drink. I've had nothing all this evening.' "'Oh, Kate, dear, I beg of you.' "'Oh, you won't, won't you? We'll see about that,' she answered, as she looked around the room for the heaviest object she could conveniently throw at him. Seeing how useless it would be to attempt to contradict her in her present mood, Dick rose to his feet and said hurriedly, "'Now there's no use getting into a passion, Kate. I'll go, I'll go. "'You'd better, I can tell you. Uh, "'What shall I get, then?' Get me half a pint of gin and be quick about it. I'm dying of thirst. Even Dick, accustomed as he was now to these scenes, could not repress a look in which there was at once mingled pity, astonishment and fear. So absolutely demoniacal did this little woman seem as she raved under the watery light of the lodging-house gas, her dark complexion gone to a dull greenish pallor. By force of contrast, she called to his mind the mild-eyed workwoman he had known in the linen draper's shop in Hanley, and he asked himself if it were possible that she and this raging creature, more like a tiger in her passion than a human being, were one and the same person. He could not choose but wonder. But another scream came, bidding him make haste, or it would be the worst for him, and he bent his head and went to fetch the gin. In the meantime, Kate's fury leaped, crackled, and burnt with the fierceness of a house in the throes of conflagration, 
and in the smoke cloud of hatred which enveloped her, only fragments of ideas and sensations flashed like falling sparks through her mind. Up and down the room she walked, swinging her arms, only hesitating for some new object whereon to wreak new fury. Suddenly it struck her that Dick had been too long away, that he was keeping her waiting on purpose, and grinding her teeth she muttered, "'Oh, the beast! Would he? Would he keep me waiting? And since nine this morning I've been alone!' In an instant her resolve was taken. It came to her sullenly, obtusely, like the instinct of revenge to an animal. She didn't stop to consider what she was doing, but seizing a large stick, the handle of a brush that happened to have been broken, she stationed herself at the top of the landing. A feverish tremor agitated her as she waited in the semi-darkness of the stairs, but at last she heard the door open, and Dick came up slowly with his usual heavy tread. She made neither sign nor stir, but allowed him to get past her, and then, raising the brush handle, she landed him one across the back. The poor man uttered a long cry, and the crash of broken glass was heard. Oh, "'What did you hit me like that for?' he cried, holding himself with both hands. "'You beast, you! I'll teach you to keep me waiting! Oh, you would, would you? Oh, do you want another? Go into the sitting-room!' Dick obeyed humbly and in silence. His only hope was that the landlady had not been awakened, and he felt uneasily at his pockets, through which he could feel the gin dripping down his legs. "'Well, have you brought the drink I sent you for? Where is it?' Uh, "'Well,' Dick replied, desirous of conciliating at any price, "'it was in my pocket, but when you hit me with that stick you broke it.' "'I broke it?' cried Kate, her eyes glistening with fire. "'Yes, dear, you did. It wasn't my fault.' "'Wasn't your fault? Oh, you horrid wretch! You put it there on purpose that I should break it!' "'Oh, now, really, Kate,' he cried, shocked by the unfairness of the accusation, "'how could I know that you were going to hit me there?' "'I don't know, and I don't care. What's that to me?' But what I'm sure of is that you always want to spite me, that you hate me, that you would wish to see me dead so you might marry Mrs. Forrest. I can't think how you can say such things. I've often told you that Mrs. Forrest and I... Oh, don't bother me. I'm not such a fool. I know she keeps you, and she'll have to pay me a drink tonight. "'Go and get another bottle of gin, and mind you pay for it with the money she gave you today. "'Yes, she shall stand me a drink tonight. "'I give you my word I haven't another penny piece upon me. "'It's just the accident.' "'But Dick did not get time to finish the sentence. "'He was interrupted by a heavy blow across the face.' and like a panther that has tasted blood, she rushed at him again, screaming all the while, "'Oh, you've no money! You liar! You liar! Saw you would make me believe she doesn't give you money, that you've no money of hers in your pocket. You'd keep it all for yourself. Oh, but you shan't, no, you shan't, for I will tear it from you and throw it in your face. Oh, that filthy money! That filthy money!' The patience with which he bore with her was truly angelic. He might easily have felled her to the ground with one stroke, but he contented himself with merely warding off the blows she aimed at him. From his great height and strength he was easily able to do this, and she struck at him with her little womanish arms as she might against a door. "'Take down your hands!' she screamed, exasperated to a last degree. "'Oh, you'd strike me, would you? You beast, I know you would!' Her rage had now reached its height. Showing her clenched teeth, she foamed at the mouth. The bloodshot eyes protruded from their sockets, and her voice grew more and more harsh and discordant. But although the excited brain gave strength to the muscles and energy to the will, unarmed she could do nothing against Dick— and suddenly becoming conscious of this, she rushed to the fireplace and seized the poker. With one sweep of the arm, she cleared the mantelboard 
and the mirror came in for a tremendous blow as she advanced around the table, brandishing her weapon. But heedless of the shattered glass, she followed in pursuit of Dick, who continued to defend himself dexterously with a chair. And it is difficult to say how long this combat might have lasted, if Dick's attention had not been interrupted by a view of the landlady's face at the door. And so touched was he by the woman's dismay when she looked upon her broken furniture that he forgot to guard himself from the poker. Kate took advantage of the occasion and whirled the weapon round her head. He saw it descending in time and half warded off the blow, but it came down with awful force on the forearm and, glancing off, inflicted a severe scalp wound. The landlady screamed, Murder! And Dick, seeing that matters had come to a crisis, closed in upon his wife, and, undeterred by yells and struggles, pinioned her and forced her into a chair. "'Oh, dear! Oh, dear! You're all bleeding, sir!' cried the landlady. "'She's nearly killed you!' Oh, "'Never mind me. But what are we to do? I think she has gone mad this time.' Oh, "'That's what I think!' said the landlady, trying to make herself heard above Kate's shrieks. "'Well, then, go and fetch a doctor, and let's hear what he has to say,' replied Dick, as he changed his grip on Kate's arm, for in a desperate struggle she had nearly succeeded in wrenching herself free. The landlady retreated precipitately towards the door. "'Well, will you go?' "'Oh, yes, yes, I'll run at once.' "'Oh, you'd better!' yelled the madwoman after her. "'I'll give it to you. Let me go. Let me go, will you?' But Dick never ceased his hold of her, and the blood dripping upon her trickled in large drops into her ears and down on to her neck and bosom. "'You're spitting on me, you beast! You filthy beast! I'll pay you out for this!' Then she perceived that it was blood. The intonation of her voice changed, and in terror she screamed, "'Murder! Murder! He's murdering me! Is there no one here to save me?' The minutes seemed like eternities. Dick felt himself growing faint, but should he lose his power over her before the doctor arrived, the consequences might be fatal to himself, so he struggled with her for very life. At last the door was opened, and a man walked into the room, tripping in so doing over a piece of the broken mirror. It was the doctor, and accustomed as he was to betray surprise at nothing, he could not repress a look of horror on catching sight of the scene around him. The apartment was almost dismantled. Chairs lay backless about the floor amid china shepherdesses and toreadors. Pictures were thrown over the sofa, and a huge pile of wax fruit, apples and purple grapes was partially reflected in a large piece of mirror that had fallen across the hearthrug. "'Come, help me to hold her,' said Dick, raising his blood-stained face. With a quick movement the doctor took possession of Kate's arms. "'Give me a sheet from the next room. I'll soon make her fast.' The threat of being tied had its effect. Kate became quieter, and after some trouble they succeeded in carrying her into the next room and laying her on the bed. There she rolled convulsively, beating the pillows with her arms— the landlady stationed herself at the door to give notice of any further manifestation of fury, while Dick explained the circumstances of the case to the doctor. After a short consultation, he agreed to sign an order declaring that, in his opinion, Mrs. Lennox was a dangerous lunatic. "'Will that be enough?' said Dick, to place her in an asylum. "'No, you'll have to get the opinion of another doctor.' The possibility of being able to rid himself of her was to him like the sudden dawning of a new life, and Dick rushed off, bleeding, haggard, wild-looking as he was, to seek for another doctor who would concur in the judgment of the first, asking himself if it were possible to see Kate in her present position and say conscientiously that she was a person who could be safely trusted with her liberty— and to his great joy this view was taken by the second authority consulted, and having placed his wife under lock and key, Dick lay down to rest a happier man than he had been for many a day. 
The position in his mind was, of course, the means he should adopt to place her in the asylum. Force was not to be thought of. Persuasion must be first tried. So far he was decided, but as to the arguments he should advance to induce her to give up her liberty, he knew nothing. Nor did he attempt to formulate any scheme, and when he entered the bedroom next morning, he relied more on the hope of finding her repentant and appealing to and working on her feelings of remorse than anything else. The whole thing, as he put it, depended upon the humour he should find her in, and he found her with stains of blood still upon her face amid the broken furniture, and she asked calmly but with intense emotion, Dick, did he say I was mad? Well, dear, I don't know that he said you were mad, except when you were the worse for drink. But he said oh, that I might become mad, she interposed, if I don't abstain from drink. Did he say that? Well, it was something like that, Kate. You know I only just escaped with my life. Only just escaped with your life, Dick? Oh, if I had killed you! If I'd killed you! Oh, if I'd seen you lying dead at my feet! And unable to think further, she fell upon her knees and reached out her arms to him. But he did not take her to his bosom, and she sobbed till, touched to the heart, he strove to console her with kind words, never forgetting, however, to introduce a hint that she was not responsible for her actions. Then I'm really downright mad said Kate, raising her tear-stained face from her arms. Did the doctor say so? This was by far too direct a question for Dick to answer. It were better to equivocate. Well, my dear, mad. He didn't say that you were always mad, but he said you were liable to fits, and that if you didn't take care, those fits would grow upon you, and you would become... Then he hesitated, as he always did, before a direct statement. But what did he say I must do to get well? He advised that you should go to a home where you would not be able to get hold of any liquor and would be looked after. You mean a madhouse? Oh, you wouldn't put me in a madhouse, Dick. I wouldn't put you anywhere you didn't like to go. But he said nothing about a madhouse. What did he say then? He spoke merely of one of those houses which are under medical supervision, and where any one can go and live for a time. A kind of hospital, you know. The argument was continued for an hour or more. Kate wept and protested against being locked up as a madwoman, while he, conscious of the stronghold he had over her, reminded her in a thousand ways of the danger she ran of awakening one morning to find herself a murderess. Yet it is difficult to persuade anyone voluntarily to enter a lunatic asylum, no matter how irrefutable the reasons advanced may be. And it was not until Dick on one side skilfully threatened her with separation, and tempted her on the other with the hope of being cured of her vice and living with him happily ever afterwards, that she consented to enter Dr. Blank's private asylum, Craven Street, Bloomsbury. But even then the battle was not won, for when he suggested going off there at once, he very nearly brought another fit of passion down on his head. It was only the extreme lassitude and debility produced from the excesses of last night that saved him. Oh, Dick, dear, if you only knew how I love you, I'd give my last drop of blood to save you from harm. I know you would, dear. It's the fault of that confounded drink, he answered, his heart tense with the hope of being rid of her. Then the packing began. Kate sat disconsolate on the sofa and watched Dick folding up her dresses and petticoats. It seemed to her that everything had ended, and wearily she collected the pearls which had been scattered in last night's skirmishing. Some had been trodden on, others were lost, and only about half the original number could be found, and shaken with nervousness and lassitude, Kate cried and wrung her hands. Dick sat next to her, kind, huge, and indifferent, even as the world itself. Oh, but you'll come and see me. 
You promise me that you'll come, that you'll come very often? Oh, yes, dear, I'll come two or three times a week, but I hope that you'll be well soon, very soon. End of chapter 27「Chapter Twenty Eight of A Mummer's Wife by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Eight The hope Dick expressed that his wife would soon be well enough to return home was, of course, untrue, his hope being that she would never cross the doors of the house in Bloomsbury whither he was taking her. The empty bed awaiting him was so great a relief that he fell on his knees before it and prayed that the doctors might judge her to be insane, unsafe to be at large. To wake up in the morning alone in his bed and to be free to go forth to his business without question seemed to him like heaven. But the pleasures of heaven last for eternity, and Dick's delight lasted but for two days. Two days after Kate had gone into the asylum, a letter came from one of the doctors saying that Mrs. Lennox was not insane and would have to be discharged. Dick sank into a chair and lay there almost stunned, plunged into despair that was like a thick fog, and it did not lift until the door opened and Kate stood before him again. He raised his head and looked at her stupidly, and interpreting his vacant face, she said, "'Dick, you're sorry to have me back again?' "'Sorry, Kate. Well, if things were different, I shouldn't be sorry. But you see, the blow you struck me with the poker very nearly did for me. I haven't been the same man since.' "'Well,' she said, "'I must go back to the asylum or the home, whatever you call it, and tell them that I'm mad.' "'Oh, there's no use in doing that, Kate. They wouldn't believe you.' Here's the letter I've just received. Read it. Oh, but, Dick, there must be some way out of this dreadful trouble, and yet there doesn't seem to be any. Try to think, dear, try to think. Can you think of anything, dear? I don't think I shall give way again. If I only had something to do, it's because I'm always alone, because I love you, because I'm jealous of that woman. "'But, Kate, if I stop here with you all day, we shall starve. "'I must go to business.' "'Oh, business, business! "'Oh, if I could go to business, too! "'The days when we used to rehearse went merrily enough.' "'Oh, you were the best claret I ever saw,' Dick answered. "'Better than Paula Marie, and I ought to know, for I rehearsed you both.' Oh, I shall never play claret again, Kate said sadly. I've lost my figure, and the part requires a waist. You might get your waist again, Dick said, and the words seemed to him extraordinarily silly, but he had to say something. If I could only get to work again, she muttered to herself, and then turning to Dick. Oh, Dick, if I could get to work again, any part would do. It doesn't matter how small, just to give me something to think about, that's all, to keep my mind off it. If the baby hadn't died, I should have had her to look after, and that would have done just as well as a part. Oh, but I've disgraced you in company. I don't blame you, you couldn't have me in it, and I couldn't bring myself to sing in that opera. Yes, you would only break out again, Kate. Those jealous fits are terrible. You think you could restrain yourself, but you couldn't, and all that would come of a row between you and Mrs. Forrest would be that I should lose my job. I know, Dick, I know, Kate cried painfully, but I promise you that I never will again. You may go where you please and do what you please. I will never say a word to you again. I'm sure you believe all that you say, Kate, but I cannot get you a job. I may hear of something, and meanwhile... Meanwhile, I shall have to stay here and alone, and no way of escaping from the hours, those long, dreary hours. No way but one. Oh, Dick, I'm sorry they didn't keep me in the asylum. It would have been better for both of us if they had. 
Then if I could go back there again, if you will take me back, I'll try to deceive the doctors. You mean, Kate, that you would play the mad woman? I doubt if any woman could do it sufficiently well to deceive the doctors. There was an Italian woman. And they talked of the great Italian actress for some time. And then Dick said, Well, Kate, I must be about my business. I'm sorry to leave you. No, Dick, you're not. Oh, I am, dear, in a way. Uh, but if I hear of anything... And he left the house, knowing that there was no further hope for himself. He was tied to her and might be killed by her in his sleep, but that wouldn't matter. What did matter was the thought that was always at the back of his mind, that she was alone in that Islington lodging-house craving for drink, striving to resist it, falling back into drink, and might be coming down raving to the theatre to insult him before the company. Insult him before the company? That had been done. She'd done her worst, and he was indifferent whether she came again. Only she must not meet Mrs. Forrest. On the whole, he felt that his sorrow was with Kate herself rather than with himself or with Mrs. Forrest. "'God only knows,' he said as he rushed down the stairs, "'what will become of her?' Kate was asking herself the same question. What was to become of her? Would it be possible for her to find work to do that would keep her mind away from the drink? She seemed for the moment free from all craving. But she knew what the craving is, how overpowering in the throat it is, and how when one has got one mouthful, one must go on and on. So intense is the delight of alcohol in the throat of the drunkard. But there was no craving upon her, and it might never come again. Every morning she awoke in great fear, but was glad to find that there was no craving in her throat, and when she went out, she rejoiced that the public houses offered no attraction to her. She became brave, and fear turned to contempt, and at the bottom of her heart she began to jeer at the demon which had conquered and brought her to ruin, and which she had in turn conquered. But there was a last mockery she did not dare, for she knew that the demon was but biding his time. He seemed, however, to go on biding it, and Dick, finding Kate reasonable every evening, came home to dinner earlier, so that the day should not appear to her intolerably long. But his business often detained him, and one night, coming home late, he noticed that she looked more sullen than usual, that her eyes drooped as if she'd been drinking. A month of scenes of violence followed. "'Not a single day, as far as I can remember, for a fortnight,' he said one day, on leaving the house and running to catch his bus to the Strand. "'Have we had a quiet evening?' When he returned that night, she ran at him with a knife, and he had only just time to ward off the blow. The house rang with shrieks and cries of all sorts, and the Lennoxes were driven from one lodging-house to another. Trousers, dresses, hats, boots, and shoes were all pawned. The comic and the pitiful are but two sides of the same thing, and it was at once comic and pitiful to see Dick, with one of the tails of his coat lost in the scrimmage, talking at one o'clock in the morning to a dispassionate policeman, while from the top windows the high treble voice of a woman disturbed the sullen tranquillity of the London night. And yet Dick continued with her, continued to allow himself to be beaten, scratched, torn to pieces almost as he would be by a wild beast. Human nature can habituate itself even to pain, and it was so with him. He knew that his present life was as a Nessus shirt upon his back, and yet he couldn't make up his mind to have done with it. In the first place he pitied his wife— in the second, he did not know how to leave her, and it was not until after another row with Kate for having been down to the theatre that he summoned up courage to walk out of the house with a fixed determination never to return again. Kate was too tipsy at the time to pay much attention to the announcement he made to her as he left the room. Besides, Wolf had been cried so often that it had now lost its terror in her ears, 
and it was not until next day that she began to experience any very certain fear that Dick and she had at last parted for ever. But when, with a clammy, thirsty mouth, she sat rocking herself wearily, and the long idleness of the morning hours became haunted with irritating remembrances of her shameful conduct, of the cruel life she led the man she loved, the black gulf of eternal separation became, as it were, etched upon her mind, and she heard the cold depths reverberating with vain words and foolish prayers. Then her thin hands trembled on her black dress, and waves of shivering passed over her. She thought involuntarily that a little brandy might give her strength, and that as soon hated herself for the thought. It was brandy that had brought her to this. She would never touch it again. But Dick had not left her for ever. He would come back to her. She couldn't live without him. It was terrible. She would go to him, and on her knees beg his pardon for all she had done. He would forgive her. He must forgive her. Such were the fugitive thoughts that flashed through Kate's mind as she hurried to and fro, seeking for her bonnet and shawl. She would go down to the theatre and find him. She'd be sure to hear news of him there, she said, as she strove to brush away the mist that obscured her eyes. She could see nothing. Things seemed to change their places, and so terrible were the palpitations of her heart that she was forced to cling to any piece of furniture within reach. But by walking very slowly, she contrived to reach the stage door of the opera comique, feeling very weak and ill. "'Is Mr. Lennox in?' she asked, at the same time trying to look conciliatingly at the hard-faced hall-keeper. "'No, ma'am, he ain't,' was the reply. "'Who attended the rehearsal today, then?' "'There was no rehearsal today, ma'am. At least ways Mr. Lennox dismissed the rehearsal at half-past twelve. "'And why?' "'Oh, that I cannot tell you.' "'Could you tell me where Mr. Lennox would be likely to be found?' "'Indeed I couldn't, ma'am. I believe he's gone into the country.' "'Gone into the country?' echoed Kate. Uh, "'But may I ask, ma'am, if you be Mrs. Lennox? "'Because if you be, Mr. Lennox left a letter to be given to you in case you called.' "'Her eyes brightened at the idea of a letter. "'To know the worst would be better than a horrible uncertainty. "'And she said eagerly, "'Yes, I'm Mrs. Lennox. Give me the letter.' The hall-keeper handed it to her, and she walked out of the narrow passage into the street, so as to be free from observation. With anxious fingers she tore open the envelope and read, "'My dear Kate, it must be now as clear to you as it is to me that it is quite impossible for us to go on living together. There's no use in our again discussing the whys and the wherefores. We had much better accept the facts of the case in silence.' and mutually save each other the pain of trying to alter what cannot be altered. I have arranged to allow you two pounds a week. This sum will be paid to you every Saturday by applying to Messrs. Jackson and Co., Solicitors, Arundel Street, Strand. Yours very affectionately, Richard Lennox. Kate mechanically repeated the last words as she walked gloomily through the glare of the day. Two pounds a week,' she said, "'and with nothing else. "'Not a friend. "'And the thought passed through her mind "'that she could not have a friend. "'She had fallen too low, "'yet from no fault of her own nor Dick's. "'And it was that that frightened her. "'A terrible sense of loneliness, of desolation, "'was created in her heart. "'For her the world seemed to have ended.' and she saw the streets and passers-by with the same vague, irresponsible gaze as a solitary figure would the universal ruin caused by an earthquake. She had no friends, no occupation, no interest of any kind in life. Everything had slipped from her, and she shivered with a sense of nakedness, of moral destitution. Nothing was left to her, and yet she felt she lived. She was conscious, oh yes, horribly conscious, and that was the worst, and she asked herself why she could not pass out of sight, out of hearing and feeling of all the crying misery with which she was surrounded, and in a state of emotive somnambulism she walked through the crowds, 
till she was startled from her dreams by hearing a voice calling after her. Kate! Kate! Mrs. Lennox! It was Montgomery. I'm so glad to have met you. Oh, so glad indeed, for we haven't seen much of each other. I don't know how it was, but somehow it seemed to me that Dick did not want me to go and see you. I never could make out why, for he couldn't have been jealous of me, he added a little bitterly. But perhaps you've not heard that it's all up as regards my piece at the Opera Comique, he continued, not noticing Kate's dejection in his excitement. No, I haven't heard, she answered mechanically. Oh, it doesn't matter much, though, for I've just been down to the gaiety, and pretty well settled that it's to be done in Manchester at the Prince's. So, you see, I don't let the grass grow under my feet, for my row with Mrs. Forrest only occurred this morning. Oh, but what's the matter, Kate? What has happened? Oh, nothing, nothing. Uh, tell me about Mrs. Forrest first. I want to know. Well, it's the funniest thing you ever heard in your life. Oh, but you won't tell Dick, because he forbade me ever to speak to you about Mrs. Forrest. Not that there's anything but business between them, that I swear to you. But do tell me, Kate, what's the matter? I never saw you look so sad in my life. Have you had any bad news? No, no. Tell me about Mrs. Forrest and your peace. I want to hear, she exclaimed excitedly. "'Well, this is it,' said Montgomery, who saw in a glance that she was not to be contradicted, and that he had better get on with his story. "'In the first place, you know that the old creature has gone in for writing librettos herself, and has finished one about Buddhism, an absurdity. The opening chorus is fifty lines long, but she won't cut one. But I'll tell you about that after. I was to get one hundred for setting this blessed production to music,' and it was to follow my own piece, which was in rehearsal. Well, like a great fool, I was explaining to Dubois the bosh I was writing by the yard for this infernal opera of hers. I couldn't help it. She wouldn't take advice on any point. She's written the Song of the Sun God in Hexameters. I don't know what Hexameters are, but I would as soon set Bradshaw. "'Leaving St. Pancras, 9.25, arriving at, uh, <laughs> with a puff-puff accompaniment on the trombone.' <laughs> "'Go on with the story,' cried Kate. "'Oh, well, I was explaining all this,' said Montgomery, suddenly growing serious. "'When out she darted from behind the other wing. I never knew she was there. "'She called me a thief, and said she wouldn't have me another five minutes in her theatre. Monty, the Italian composer, was sent for. I was shoved out bag and baggage, and there'll be no more rehearsals till the new music is ready. That's all. Oh, I'm very sorry for you. Very sorry, said Kate very quietly, and she raised her hand to brush away a tear. Oh, I don't care. I'd sooner have the peace done in Manchester. Of course, it's a bore losing a hundred pounds. But, oh, Kate, do tell me what's the matter. You know you can confide in me. You know I'm your friend. At these kind words, the cold, deadly grief that encircled Kate's heart like a band of steel melted, and she wept profusely. Montgomery drew her arm into his and pleaded and begged to be told the reason of these tears, but she could make no answer and pressed Dick's letter into his hand with a passionate gesture. He read it at a glance, and then hesitated, unable to make up his mind as to what he should do. No words seemed to him adequate wherewith to console her, and she was sobbing so bitterly that it was beginning to attract attention in the streets. They walked on without speaking for a few yards, Kate leaning upon Montgomery, until a hackney coachman, guessing that something was wrong, signed to them with his whip. "'Where are you living, dear?' Kate told him with some difficulty, and having directed the driver, he lapsed again into considering what course he should adopt. To put off the journey was impossible. Dick had promised to meet him there. It was now three o'clock. He had therefore three hours to spend with Kate, with the woman whom he had loved steadfastly throughout a loveless life. 
He had no word of blame for Dick. He had heard stories that had made his blood run cold. And yet, knowing her faults as he did, he would have opened his arms had it been possible, and crying through the fervour of years of waiting, said to her, "'Yes, I will believe in you. Believe in me, and you shall be happy.' There had never been a secret between them. Their souls had been forever as if in communication, and the love, unacknowledged in words, had long been as sunlight and moonlight, lighting the spaces of their dream life. To the woman it had been as a distant star, whose pale light was a presage of quietude in hours of vexation. To the man it seemed as a far Elysium, radiant with sweet longing, large hopes that waxed but never waned, and where the sweet breezes of eternal felicity blew in musical cadence. And yet he was deceived in nothing. He knew now, as he had known before, that although this dream might haunt him for ever, he should never hold it in his arms nor press it to his lips. And in the midst of this surging tide of misery there arose a desire that, glad in its own anguish, bade him increase the bitterness of these last hours by making a confession of his suffering. And exulting savagely in the martyrdom he was preparing for himself, he said, "'You know, Kate, I know you must know. You must have guessed that I care for you. I may as well tell you the truth now. You're the only woman I ever loved.' Oh, "'Yes,' she said. "'I always thought you cared for me. "'Oh, you have been very kind, oh, very kind, "'and I often think of it. Oh, "'Everybody has all my life long been very good to me. "'It's I alone whom to blame, who am in fault. "'I have, I know I have been very wicked, "'and I don't know why.' I didn't mean it. I, I know I didn't, for I'm not at heart a wicked woman. I suppose things must have gone against me. That's about all. Montgomery pushed his glasses higher on his nose, and after a long silence he said, I've often thought that had you met me before you knew Dick, things might have been different. We should have got on better, although you might never have loved me so well. Kate raised her eyes. And she said, No one will ever know how I have loved, oh, how I still love that man. Oftentimes I think that had I loved him less, I should have been a better wife. I think he loved me, but it was not the love I dreamed of. Like you, I was always sentimental, and Dick never cared for that sort of thing. I think I should have understood you better, said Montgomery, and the conversation came to a pause. A vision of the life of devotion spent at the feet of an ideal lover, that life of sacrifice and tenderness which had been her dream, and which she had so utterly failed to attain, again rose up to tantalise her like a glittering mirage, and she couldn't help wondering whether she would have realised this beautiful, this wonderful might have been, if she had chosen this other man. Mm, "'But I suppose you'll make it up with Dick,' said Montgomery, somewhat harshly. Kate awoke from her reverie with a start, and answered sorrowfully that she did not know, that she was afraid Dick would never forgive her again. "'I don't remember if I told you I'm going to see him in Manchester. He promised to go up there to make some arrangements about my peace.' "'No, you didn't tell me.' "'Well, I'll speak to him. I'll tell him I've seen you. I fancy I shall be able to make it all right,' he added, with a feeble smile." "'Oh, how good you are! Oh, how good you are!' cried Kate, clasping her hands. "'If you'll only forgive me once again, I'll promise, I'll swear to him never to—to—' to... Here Kate stopped abashed, and burying her face in her hands she wept bitterly. The tenderness, the melancholy serenity of their interview had somehow suddenly come to an end— each was too much occupied with his or her thoughts to talk much, and the effort to find phrases grew more and more irritating. Both were very sad, and although they sighed when the clock struck the hour of farewell, they felt that to pass from one pain to another was in itself an assuagement. Kate accompanied Montgomery to the station. He seemed to her to be out of temper, 
and she to him to be further away than ever. The explanation that had taken place between them had, if not broken, at least altered the old bonds of sympathy without creating new ones, and they were discontented, even like children who remember for the first time that today is not yesterday. They felt lonely watching the parallel lines of platforms, and when Montgomery waved his hand for the last time, and the train rolled into the luminous arch of sky that lay beyond the glass roofing, Kate turned away, overpowered by grief and cruel recollections. When she got home, the solitude of her room became unbearable. She wanted someone to see, someone to console her. She had a few shillings in her pocket, but she remembered her resolutions, and for some time resented the impervious clutch of the temptation. But the sorrow that hung about her, that penetrated like a corrosive acid into the very marrow of her bones, grew momentarily more burning, more unendurable. Twenty times she tried to wrench it out of her heart. The landlady brought her up some tea. She couldn't drink it. It tasted like soap suds in her mouth. And then, knowing well what the results would be, she resolved to go out for a walk. Next day she was ill, and to pull herself together it was necessary to have a drink. It would not do to look too great a sight in the solicitor's office where Dick had told her in his letter to go and get her money. There she found not two, but five pounds awaiting her, and this enabled her to keep up a stage of semi-intoxication until the end of the week. She at last woke up speechless, suffering terrible palpitations of the heart, but she had strength enough to ring her bell, and when the landlady came to her she nearly lost her balance and fell to the ground, so strenuously did Kate lean and cling to her for support. After gasping painfully for some moments, Kate muttered, "'I'm dying! These palpitations and the pain in my side!' The landlady asked if she'd like to see the doctor, and with difficulty obtained her consent that the doctor should be sent for. "'I'll send at once,' she said. "'No, not at once,' Kate cried. "'Pour me out a little brandy and water, and I'll see how I am in the course of the day.' The woman did as was desired, and Kate told her that she felt better, and that if it wasn't for the pains in her side she'd be all right. The landlady looked a little incredulous, but her lodger had only been with her a fortnight, and so carefully had the brandy been hidden and the inebriety concealed that although she had her doubts, she was not yet satisfied that Kate was an habitual drunkard. Certainly appearances were against Mrs. Lennox, but as regards the brandy bottle, she had watched it very carefully and was convinced that scarcely more than six pennyworth of liquor went out of it daily. The good woman did not know how it was replenished from another bottle that came sometimes from under the mattress and sometimes out of the chimney, and the disappearance of the husband was satisfactorily accounted for by the announcement that he had gone to Manchester to produce a new piece. Besides, Mrs. Lennox was a very nice person. It was a pleasure to attend to her, and during the course of the afternoon Mrs. White called several times at the second floor to inquire after her lodger's health. But there was no change for the better. Looking the picture of wretchedness, Kate lay back in her chair, declaring in low moans that she never felt so ill in her life, that the pain in her side was killing her. At first Mrs. White seemed inclined to make light of all this complaining, but towards evening she began to grow alarmed, and urged that the doctor should be sent for. "'I assure you, ma'am,' she said, "'it's always better to see a doctor. "'The money's never thrown away, for even if there's nothing serious the matter, "'it eases one's mind to be told so.' Kate was generally easy to persuade, but fearing that her secret drinking would be discovered, she declined for a long time to take medical advice. At last she was obliged to give way, and the die having been cast, she commenced to think how she might conceal part of the truth. Something of the coquetry of the actress returned to her, and getting up from her chair she went over to the glass to examine herself, and brushing back her hair she said sorrowfully, oh, "'I'm a complete wreck. I can't think what's the matter with me, and I've lost all my hair.' 
Oh, you've no idea, Mrs. White, of the beautiful hair I used to have. It used to fall in armfuls over my shoulders. Now it's no more than a wisp. I think you've a great deal yet, replied Mrs. White, not wishing to discourage her. Oh, and how yellow I am, too! To this Mrs. White mumbled something that was inaudible, and Kate thought suddenly of her rouge pot and hare's foot. Her make-up and all her little souvenirs of Dick lay securely packed away in an old bandbox. Mrs. White, she said, might I ask you to get me a jug of hot water? When the woman left the room, everything was spread hurriedly over the toilet table. To see her, one would have thought that the call-boy had knocked at the door for the second time. A thin coating of cold cream was passed over the face and neck, then the powder puff changed what was yellow into white, and then the hare's foot gave a bloom to the cheeks. The pencil was not necessary, her eyebrows being by nature dark and well-defined. Then all disappeared again into the bandbox, a drain was taken out of the bottle while she listened to steps on the stairs, and she had just time to get back to her chair when the doctor entered. She felt quite prepared to receive him. Mrs. White, who had come up at the same time, looked uneasily around, and after hesitating about the confines of the room, she put the water jug on the rosewood cabinet and said, "'I think I'll leave you alone with the doctor, ma'am. If you want me, you'll ring.' Mr. Hooper was a short, stout man, with a large, bald forehead and long black hair. His small eyes were watchful as a ferret's, and his fat, chubby hands were constantly laid on his kneecaps. "'I met Mrs. White's servant in the street,' he said, looking at Kate as if he were trying to read through the rouge on her face. "'So I came at once. "'Mrs. White, with whom I was speaking downstairs, tells me you're suffering from a pain in your side.' "'Yes, Doctor, on the right side, and I've, I've not been feeling very well lately. "'Is your appetite good? Will you let me feel your pulse?' "'No, I've scarcely any appetite at all, particularly in the morning. "'I can't touch anything for breakfast.' "'Don't you care to drink anything? Aren't you thirsty?' "'Kate would have liked to have told a lie, "'but fearing that she might endanger her life by doing so, she answered— "'Oh, yes, I'm constantly very thirsty.' "'Especially at night-time. "'It was irritating to have your life read thus, "'and Kate felt angry when she saw this dispassionate man "'watching the brandy-bottle, which she had forgotten to put away. "'Do you ever find it necessary to take any stimulant?' "'Grasping at the word necessary, she replied, "'Oh, yes, doctor.' My life isn't a very happy one, and I often feel so low, so depressed, as it were, that if I didn't take a little something to keep me up, I think I should do away with myself. Your husband is an actor, I believe? Yes, but he's at present up in Manchester, producing a new piece. I'm on the stage, too. I've been playing a round of leading parts in the provinces, but since I've been in London, I've been out of an engagement. I just asked you because I noticed you used a little powder, you know, on the face. Of course, I can't judge at present what your complexion is, but have you noticed any yellowness about the skin lately? The first instinct of a woman who drinks is to conceal her vice, and although she was talking to a doctor, Kate was again conscious of a feeling of resentment against the merciless eyes which saw through all the secrets of her life. But... Cowed, as it were, by the certitude expressed by the doctor's looks and words, she strove to equivocate, and answered humbly that she noticed her skin was not looking as clear as it used to. Dr. Hooper then questioned her further. He asked if she suffered from a sense of uncomfortable tension, fullness and weight, especially after meals, if she felt any pain in her right shoulder, and she confessed that he was right in all his surmises. Oh, do tell me, Doctor, what's the matter with me. I assure you I'd really much sooner know the worst. But the Doctor did not seem inclined to be communicative, and in reply to her question he merely mumbled something to the effect that the liver was out of order. I will send you over some medicine this evening, he said, and if you don't feel better tomorrow, send round for me, and don't attempt to get up. 
"'I think,' he added, as he took up his hat to go, "'I shall be able to put you all right. "'But you must follow my instructions. "'You mustn't frighten yourself, "'and take as little of that stimulant as possible.' Kate answered that it was not her custom to take too much, and she tried to look surprised at the warning. She nevertheless derived a good deal of comfort from the doctor's visit, and during the course of the evening succeeded in persuading herself that her fears of the morning were ill-founded, and putting the medicine that was sent her away for the present, she helped herself from a bottle that was hidden in the upholstery. The fact of having a long letter to write to Dick explaining her conduct made it quite necessary that she should take something to keep her up, and sitting in her lonely room she drank on steadily until midnight, when she could only just drag her clothes from her back and throw herself stupidly into bed. There she passed a night full of livid-hued nightmares from which she awoke shivering and suffering from terrible palpitations of the heart. The silence of the house filled her with terrors, cold and obtuse as the dreams from which she awakened. Strength to scream for help she had none, and thinking she was going to die, she sought for relief and consolation in the bottle that lay hidden under the carpet. When the drink took effect upon her, she broke out into a profuse perspiration, and she managed to get a little sleep. But when her breakfast was brought up about eleven o'clock in the morning— so ill did she seem that the servant, fearing she was going to drop down dead, begged to be allowed to fetch the doctor. But rejecting all offers of assistance, Kate lay moaning in an armchair, unable even to taste the cup of tea that the maid pressed upon her. She consented to take some of the medicines that were ordered her, but whatever good they might have produced was discounted by the constant nip-drinking she kept up during the afternoon. The next day she was very ill indeed, and Mrs. White, greatly alarmed, insisted on sending for Dr. Hooper. He did not seem astonished at the change in his patient. Calmly and quietly he watched for some moments in silence. The bed had curtains of a red and antiquated material, and these contrasted with the paleness of the sheets wherein Kate lay, tossing feverishly. Most of the make-up had been rubbed away from her face— and through patches of red and white the yellow skin started like blisters. She was slightly delirious, and when the doctor took her hand to feel her pulse, she gazed at him with her big staring eyes and spoke volubly and excitedly. "'Oh, I'm so glad you've come, for I wanted to speak to you about my husband. I think I told you he'd gone to Manchester to produce a new piece. I don't know if I led you to suppose that he deserted me, but if I did I was wrong to do so, for he's done nothing of the kind. It's true that we aren't very happy together, but I dare say that's my fault. I never was, I know, as good a wife to him as I intended to be, but then he made me jealous, and sometimes I was mad. Oh, yes, I think I must have been mad to have spoken to him in the way I did. Anyhow, it doesn't matter now, does it, Doctor? But I don't know what I'm saying. Still, you won't mention that I've told you anything. It's as likely as not that he'll forgive me just as he did before. And we may yet be as happy as we were at Blackpool. You won't tell him, will you, Doctor? No, no, I won't, said Dr. Hooper, quietly and firmly. But you mustn't talk as much as you do. If you want to see your husband, you must get well first. "'Oh, yes, I must get well. "'Oh, but tell me, Doctor, how long will that take?' "'Not very long, if you will keep quiet and do what I tell you. "'I want you to tell me how the pain in your side is.' Oh, "'Very bad. Far worse than when I saw you last. "'I feel it now in my right shoulder as well. "'But your side, is it sore when you touch it? "'Will you let me feel?' Without waiting for a reply, he passed his hand under the sheet. "'Is it there that it pains you?' "'Yes, oh, yes, you're hurting me!' Then the doctor walked aside with the landlady, who had been watching the examination of the patient with anxious eyes. She said, "'Do you think it's anything very dangerous? Is it contagious? Had I better send her to the hospital?' "'No, I should scarcely think it worth while doing that.' She will be well in a week, that is to say, if she's properly looked after. She's suffering from acute congestion of the liver, brought on by... 
by drink, said Mrs. White. I suspected as much. Oh, you've too much to do, Mrs. White, with all your children, to give up your time to nursing her. I shall send someone round as soon as possible. But in the meantime, will you see that her diet is regulated to half a cup of beef tea every hour or so? If she complains of thirst, let her have some milk to drink, and you may mix a little brandy with it. Tonight I shall send round a sleeping draught. You're sure, Doctor, there's nothing catching, for you know that with all my children in the house, you need not be alarmed, Mrs. White. Uh, but do you think, Doctor, it'll be an expensive illness, for I know very little about her circumstances. I expect she'll be all right in a week or ten days, but what I fear for is her future. I've had a good deal of experience in such matters, and I've never known a case of a woman who cured herself of the vice of intemperance. A man, sometimes, a woman, never. The landlady sighed, and referred to all she had gone through during poor Mr. White's lifetime. The doctor spoke confidingly of a lady who was at present under his charge, and apparently overcome with pity for suffering humanity, they descended the staircase together. On the doorstep the conversation was continued. "'Very well, then, Doctor, I will take your advice. But at the end of a week or so, when she's quite recovered, I shall tell her that I've let her rooms. For, as you say, a woman rarely cures herself, and before the children the example would be dreadful. I expect to see her on her feet in about that time. Then you can do as you please. I shall call tomorrow.' Next day the professional nurse took her place by the bedside. The sinapism which the doctor ordered was applied to the hepatic region, and a small dose of calomel was administered. Under this treatment she improved rapidly, but unfortunately, as her health returned, her taste for drink increased in a like proportion. Indeed, it was almost impossible to keep her from it, and on one occasion she tried very cunningly to outwit the nurse who had fallen asleep in her chair. Waiting patiently until the woman's snoring had become sufficiently regular to warrant the possibility of a successful attempt being made on the brandy bottle, Kate slipped noiselessly out of bed. The unseen nightlight cast a rosy glow over the convex side of the basin, without, however, disturbing the bare darkness of the wall. Kate knew that all the bottles stood in a line upon the chest of drawers, but it was difficult to distinguish one from the other— and the jingling she made as she fumbled amid them awoke the nurse, who, divining at once what was happening, arose quickly from her chair and, advancing rapidly towards her, said, "'No, ma'am, I really can't allow it. It's against the doctor's orders.' "'I'm not going to die of thirst to please any doctor. I was only going to take a little milk. I suppose there's no harm in that?' "'Not the least, ma'am, and if you'd called me, you should have had it.' It was owing to this fortuitous intervention that when Dr. Hooper called a couple of days after to see his patient, he was able to certify to a remarkable change for the better in her. All the distressing symptoms had disappeared, the pain in her side had died away, the complexion was clearer. He therefore thought himself justified in ordering for her lunch a little fish and some weak brandy and water, and to Kate, who had not eaten any solid food for several days, this first meal took the importance of a very exceptional event. Sitting by her bedside, Dr. Hooper spoke to her. "'Now, Mrs. Lennox,' he said, "'I want to give you a word of warning. "'I've seen you through what I must specify as a serious illness. "'Dangerous, I will not call it, "'although I might do so if I were to look into the future "'and anticipate the development the disease will most certainly take.' "'unless, indeed, you will be guided by me "'and make a vow against all intoxicating liquors.' "'At this direct allusion to her vice, "'Kate stopped eating, and putting down the fork, "'looked at the doctor. "'Now, Mrs. Lennox, you mustn't be angry,' "'he continued in his kind way. "'I'm speaking to you in my capacity as a medical man.' "'and I must warn you against the continuous nip-drinking, "'which, of course, I can see you're in the habit of indulging in, "'and which was the cause of the illness from which you're recovering. 
I will not harrow your feelings by referring to all the cases that have come under my notice, where shame, disgrace, ruin, and death were the result of that one melancholy failing, drink. Oh, sir, cried Kate, broken-hearted, if you only knew how unhappy I've been, how miserable I am, you wouldn't speak to me so. I've my failing, it is true, but I'm driven to it. I love my husband better than anything in the world, and I see him mixed up always with a lot of girls at the theatre, and it sends me mad. And then I go to drink so as to forget. We've all got our troubles, but it doesn't relieve us of the burden. It only makes us forget it for a short time, and then when consciousness returns to us, we only remember it all the more bitterly. No, Mrs. Lennox, take my advice. In a few days, when you're well, go to your husband, demand his forgiveness, and resolve then never to touch spirits again. It's very good of you to speak to me in this way, said Kate tearfully, and I will take your advice. The very first day that I'm strong enough to walk down to the Strand, I will go and see my husband, and if he will give me another trial, he will not, I swear to you, have cause to repent it. Oh, she continued, you don't know how good he's been to me, how he has borne with me. If it hadn't been that he tried my temper by flirting with other women, we might have been happy now. Then, as Kate proceeded to speak of her trials and temptations, she grew more and more excited and hysterical, until the doctor, fearing that she would bring on a relapse, was forced to plead an engagement and wish her good-bye. As he left the room, she cried after him, "'The first day I'm well enough to go out, I'll go and see my husband.'" End of chapter 28《Chapter Twenty Nine of A Mama's Wife by George Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Nine. The next few days passed like dreams. Kate's soul, tense with the longing for reconciliation, floated at ease over the sordid miseries that lay within and without her, and enraptured with expectation, she lived in a beautiful paradise of hope. So certain did she feel of being able to cross out the last few years of her life that her mind was scarcely clouded by a doubt of the possibility of his declining to forgive her, that he might even refuse to see her. The old days seemed charming to her, and looking back, even she seemed to have been perfect then. There her life appeared to have begun. She never thought of Hanley now. Ralph and Mrs. Ede were like dim shadows that had no concern in her existence. The potteries and the hills were as the recollections of childhood, dim and unimportant. The footlights and the applause of audiences were also dying echoes in her ears. Her life, for the moment, was concentrated in a loving memory of a Lancashire seashore and a rose-coloured room, where she used to sit on the knees of the man she adored. The languors and the mental weakness of convalescence were conducive to this state of mental exaltation. She loved him better than anyone else could love him. She would never touch brandy again. He would take her back, and they would live as the lovers did in all the novels she had ever read. These illusions filled Kate's mind like a scarf of white mist hanging around the face of a radiant morning and as she lay back amid the pillows, or sat dreaming by the fireside in the long evenings that were no longer lonely to her, she formed plans, and considered how she should plead to Dick in this much-desired interview. During this period, dozens of letters were written and destroyed, and it was not until the time arrived for her to go to the theatre to see him that she could decide upon what she could write. Then hastily she scribbled a note— but her hand trembled so much that before she had said half what she intended, the paper was covered with blotched and blurred lines. "'Oh, it won't do to let him think I'm drunk again,' she said to herself, as she threw aside what she had written and read over one of her previous efforts. It ran as follows. "'My darling Dick, 
"'You will, I am sure, be sorry to hear that I've been very ill. "'I am now, however, much better. "'Indeed, I may say, quite recovered. "'During my illness I've been thinking over our quarrels, "'and I now see how badly, how wickedly I've behaved to you on many occasions. "'I do not know, and I scarcely dare to hope that you will ever forgive me, "'but I trust that you will not refuse to see me for a few minutes.' "'I have not, I assure you, tasted spirits for some weeks, "'so you needn't fear that I'll kick up a row. "'I will promise to be very quiet. "'I will not reproach you, nor get excited, nor raise my voice. "'I shall be very good, and will not detain you but for a very short time. Oh, "'You will not. "'You cannot, oh, my darling, deny me this one little request.' to see you again, although only for a few minutes. Your affectionate wife, Kate. Compared with the fervid thoughts of her brain, these words appeared to her weak and poor, but feeling that for the moment at least she could not add to their intensity, she set out on her walk, hoping to find her husband at the theatre. It was about eight o'clock in the evening. A light grey fog hung over the background of the streets, and the line of the housetops was almost lost in the morose shadows that fell from a soot-coloured sky. Here and there a chimney-stack or the sharp spire of a church tore the muslin-like curtains of descending mist, and vague as the mist were her thoughts. The streets twisted, wriggling their way through slime and gloom, whilst at every turning the broad, flaring windows of the public houses marked the English highway. But Kate paid no attention to the red-lettered temptations. Docile and hopeful as a tired animal thinking of its stable, she walked through the dark crowd that pressed upon her, nor did she even notice when she was jostled, but went on, a heedless nondescript, a something in a black shawl and a quasi-respectable bonnet, a slippery stepping-stone between the low women who whispered and the workwoman who hurried home with the tin of evening beer in her hand. Like one held and guided by the power of a dream, she lost consciousness of all that was not of it. Thoughts of how Dick would receive her and forgive her were folded, entangled, and broken within narrow limits of time. Half an hour passed like a minute, and she found herself at the stage door of the theatre. Drawing the letter from her pocket, she said to the hall-keeper, "'Will you kindly give Mr. Lennox this letter? Has he arrived yet?' "'Yes, but he's busy for the moment. "'Oh, but,' um, the man added, as he examined Kate's features narrowly, uh, "'you'll excuse me. I made a mistake. "'Mr. Lennox isn't in the theatre. "'At that moment the swinging door was thrust open, "'and the call-boy screamed, "'Mr. Lennox says you're not to let Miss Thomas pass tonight, "'and if there's any letters for him, I'm to take them in.' "'Here's one. Would you give it to Mr. Lennox?' said Kate, "'eagerly thrusting forward her note. "'Say that I'm waiting for an answer.' The stage doorkeeper tried to interpose, but before he could explain himself, the boy had rushed away. "'All letters should be given to me,' he growled as he turned away to argue with Miss Thomas, who had just arrived. In a few minutes the call-boy came back. "'Will you please step this way?' he said to Kate. "'No, you shan't,' cried the hall-keeper. "'If you try any nonsense with me, I shall send round for a policeman.' Kate started back, frightened, thinking these words were addressed to her, but a glance showed her that she was mistaken. "'Oh, how dare you talk to me like that! You're an unsophisticated beast!' cried Miss Thomas. "'Pass under my arm, ma'am,' said the hall-keeper. "'I don't want this one to get through.' And amid a storm of violent words and the strains of distant music, Kate went up a narrow staircase that creaked under the weight of a group of girls in strange dresses. When she got past them, she saw Dick at the door of his room, waiting for her. The table was covered with letters, the walls with bills announcing a great success. He took her hand and placed her in a chair, and at first it seemed doubtful who would break an awkward and irritating silence. At last Dick said, "'I'm sorry to hear, Kate, that you've been ill. You're looking well now.' "'Yes, I'm better now,' she replied drearily. "'But perhaps if I'd died it would have been as well, "'for you can never love me again.' 
"'Oh, you know, my dear,' he said, equivocating, "'that we didn't get on well together.' "'Oh, Dick, I know it. "'You were very good to me, "'and I made your life wretched on account of my jealousy. "'But I couldn't help it, "'for I loved you better than a woman ever loved a man. "'I cannot tell you, "'I cannot find words to express how much I love you. "'You're everything to me. "'I lived for your love, and I'm dying of it. "'Yes, Dick, I'm dying for love of you. "'I feel it here.' It devours me like a fire, and what is so strange is that nothing seems real to me except you. I never think of anything but of things that concern you. Anything that ever belonged to you I treasure up as a relic. You know the chaplet of pearls I used to wear when we played the lover's knot? Well, I have them still, although all else has gone from me. The string was broken once or twice, and some of the pearls were lost— but I threaded them again, and it still goes round my neck. I was looking at them the other day, and it made me very sad, for it made me think of the happy days, oh, the very happy days that we have had together before I took to... Oh, but I won't speak of that. I've cured myself. Yes, I assure you, Dick, I've cured myself, and it's for that I've come to talk to you. "'Were I not sure that I would never touch brandy again, "'I wouldn't ask you to take me back. "'But I'd sooner die than do what I've done, "'for I know that I never will. "'Can you, will you, my own darling Dick, "'give me another trial?' "'The victory hung in the balance, "'but at that moment a superb girl "'in all the splendour of long green tights "'and resplendent with breastplate and spear "'flung open the door. "'Look here, Dick,' she began, "'but seeing Kate, she stopped short "'and stammered out an apology. "'I shall be down on the stage in a minute, dear,' "'he said, rising from his chair. "'The door was shut.' and they were again alone, but Kate felt that chance had gone against her. The interruption had, with a sudden shock, killed the emotions she had succeeded in awakening, and had supplied Dick with an answer that would lead him, by a way after his own heart, straight out of his difficulty. "'My dear,' he said, rising from his chair, "'I'm glad you've given up the uh, you-know-what for between you and me that was the cause of all our trouble. But, candidly speaking, I don't think it would be advisable for us to live together, at least for the present, and I'll tell you why. I know that you love me very much, but as you said yourself just now, it's your jealousy and the drink together that excites you, and leads up to these terrible rows. Now, the best plan would be for us to live apart, let us say for six months or so, until you've entirely gotten over your little weakness, you know, and then why we'll be as happy as we used to be at Blackpool in the dear old times long ago. Oh, Dick, don't say that I must wait six months. I might be dead before then. But you're not speaking the truth to me. "'You were just going to say that I might come back to you when the horrid girl came in. "'I know. Yes, I believe there's something between you. "'Now, Kate, remember your promise not to kick up a row. "'I consented to see you because you said you wouldn't be violent. Here's your letter. "'I'm not going to be violent, Dick, but six months seems such a long time.' "'It won't be as long passing as you think. "'And now I must run away. "'They're waiting for me on the stage. "'Have you seen the piece? "'Would you like to go in front?' "'No, not tonight, Dick. "'I feel too sad. "'But won't you kiss me before I go?' "'Dick bent his face and kissed her, "'but there was a chill in the kiss that went to her heart, "'and she felt that his lips would never touch hers again.' But she had no protest to make, and almost in silence she allowed herself to be shown out of the theatre. When she got into the mist, she shivered a little, and drew her thin shawl tighter about her thin shoulders, and with one of the choruses still ringing in her ears, she walked in the direction of the strand. Somehow 
Her sorrow did not seem too great for her to bear. The interview had passed neither as badly nor as well as had been expected, and thinking of the six months of probation that lay before her, but without being in the least able to realise their meaning, she walked dreaming through the sloppy, fog-smelling streets. The lamps were now but like furred patches of yellow laid on a dead grey background, and a mud-bespattered crowd rolled in and out of the darkness. The roofs overhead were engulfed in the soot-coloured sky that seemed to be descending on the heads of the passengers. Men passed carrying parcels, the white necktie of a theatre-goer was caught sight of. From Lambeth, from Islington, from Pimlico, from all the dark corners where it had been lurking in the daytime, prostitution, at the fading of the light, had descended on the town. Portly matrons, very respectable, in brown silk dresses and veils, stood in the corners of alleys and dingy courts, scorned by the younger generation. Young girls of fifteen and sixteen, going by in couples, with wisps of dyed hair hanging about their shoulders, advertisements of their age, the elder taking the responsibility of choosing. Germans in long ulsters trafficked in guttural intonations, policemen on their beats could have looked less concerned. The English hung around the public houses, enviously watching the arched insteps of the French women tripping by. Smiles there were plenty, but the fog was so thick that even the Parisians lost their native levity and wished themselves back in Paris. At the crossing of Wellington Street she stumbled against a small man who leaned against a doorway, coughing violently. They stared at each other in profound astonishment, and then Kate said in a pained and broken voice, "'Oh, Ralph, is it you?' "'Yes, indeed it is, but to think of meeting you here in London.' They had for the second, in a sort of way, forgotten that they had once been man and wife, and after a pause Kate said, "'Oh, but that's just what I was thinking. What are you doing in London?' Ralph was about to answer when he was cut short by a fit of coughing. His head sank into his chest, and his little body was shaken until it seemed as if it were going to break to pieces like a bundle of sticks. Kate looked at him pityingly, and passing unconsciously over the dividing years, just as she might have done when they kept shop together in Hanley, she said, "'Oh, you know you shouldn't stop out in such weather as this. You'll be breathless tomorrow.' "'Oh, no, I shan't. I've got a new remedy. But I've lost my way. That's the reason why I'm so late. "'Oh, perhaps I can tell you. Where are you staying?' Oh, "'In a hotel in Bedford Street, near Covent Garden.' "'Well, then, this is your way. You've come too far.' And passing again into the jostling crowd, they walked on in silence, side by side. A slanting cloud of fog had drifted from the river down into the street, creating a shivering and terrifying darkness. The cabs moved at walking pace, the huge omnibuses stopped belated, and their advertisements could not be read, even when a block occurred close under a gas lamp. The jeweller's windows emitted the most light, but even gold and silver wares seemed to have become tarnished in the sickening atmosphere. Then the smell from fishmongers' shops grew more sour as the assistant piled up the lobsters and flooded the marbles preparatory to closing, and just within the circle of vision, inhaling the greasy fragrance of soup, a woman in a blue bonnet loitered near a grating. Oh, "'This is Bedford Street, I think,' said Kate, "'but it's so dark that it's impossible to see.' "'I suppose you know London well.' "'replied Ralph, somewhat pointedly. "'Pretty well. I've been here now for some time.' "'For the last three or four minutes not a word had been spoken. "'Kate was surprised that Ralph was not angry with her. "'She wanted to speak to him of old times, "'but it was hard to break the ice of intervening years. "'At last, as they stopped before the door of a small family hotel, "'he said, "'It's now something like four years since we parted, ain't it?' The question startled her, but she answered nervously and hurriedly. "'Oh, I suppose it is, oh, but I'd better wish you good-bye now. You're safe at home.' "'Oh, no. Come in. You look so very tired. A glass of wine will do you good.' 
"'Besides, what harm? "'Wasn't I your husband once?' "'Oh, Ralph, how can you? "'Well, there's no reason why I shouldn't hear "'how you've been getting on. "'We're just like strangers, so many things have occurred. "'I've married since. "'Oh, but perhaps you didn't hear of it.' "'Married? Who did you marry?' "'Well, I married your assistant, Hender.' "'What? Hender, your wife?' said Kate, "'with an intonation of voice that was full of pain. "'A dagger thrust suddenly through her side as she went up the staircase "'could not have wounded her more cruelly than the news "'that the woman who had been her assistant "'now owned the house that once was hers. "'The story of the dog in the manger is as old as the world.' Through the windows of the little public sitting-room nothing was visible. Everything was shrouded in the yellow curtain of fog. A commercial traveller had drawn off his boots and was warming his slippered feet by the fire. "'Dreadful weather, sir,' said the man. "'I'm afraid it won't do your cough much good. Will you come near the fire?' Oh, "'Thank you,' said Ralph. Kate mechanically drew forward a chair. It would be impossible for them to say a word, for the traveller was evidently inclined to be garrulous, and both wondered what they should do. But at that moment the chambermaid came to announce that the gentleman's room was ready. He took up his boots and retired, leaving the two, who had once been husband and wife, alone. And yet it seemed as difficult as ever to speak of what was uppermost in their minds. Kate helped Ralph off with his greatcoat, and she noticed that he looked thinner and paler. The servant brought up two glasses of grog, and when Kate had taken off her bonnet, she said, "'Do you think I'm much altered?' "'Well, since you ask me, Kate, I must say I don't think you're looking very well. You're thinner than you used to be, and you've lost a good deal of your hair.' "'I've only just recovered from a bad illness,' she said, sighing. And as she raised the glass to her lips, the gaslight defined the whole contour of her head. The thick hair that used to encircle her pale prominent temples like rich velvet looked now like a black silk band, frayed and whitened at the seam. "'But what have you been doing? Have things gone pretty well with you?' said Ralph, whose breath came from him in a thin but continuous whistle. "'What happened when I got my decree of divorce?' "'Oh, nothing particular for a while, but afterwards we were married.' "'Oh,' said Ralph, "'so he married you, did he? "'Well, I shouldn't have expected it of him. "'So we're both married, isn't it odd? "'And meeting, too, in this way.' "'Yes, many things have happened since then. "'I've been on the stage, travelling all over England.' "'What?' "'You on the stage, Kate,' said Ralph, lifting his head from his hand. "'Oh, Lord! Oh, Lord! How... <laughs> oh, but I mustn't laugh. I won't be able to breathe.' Kate turned to him almost angrily, and the ghost of the prima donna awakening in her, she said, "'I don't see what there is to laugh at. I've played all the leading parts, and in all the principal towns in England, Liverpool, Manchester and Leeds, the Newcastle Chronicles said my Sir Paulette was the best they'd seen. Ralph looked bewildered, like a man blinded for a moment by a sudden flash of lightning. He could not at once realise that this woman, who had been his wife, who had washed and scrubbed in his little home in Hanley was now one of those luminous women who in clear skirts and pink stockings wander singing beautiful songs amid illimitable forests and unscalable mountains. For a moment he regretted he had married Miss Hender. "'But I don't think I shall ever act again.' "'How's that?' he said, with an intonation of disappointment in his voice. "'I don't know,' said Kate. "'I'm not living with my husband now, "'and I haven't the courage to look out for an engagement myself.' "'Ralph stared at her vaguely. "'Look out for an engagement?' he repeated to himself. "'It seemed to him that he must be dreaming. "'Aren't you happy with him? "'Doesn't he treat you well?' said Ralph, "'dropping perforce from his dream back into reality.' "'Oh, yes, he's always been very good to me. "'I can't say how it was, but somehow after a time we didn't get on. "'I dare say it was my fault. "'But how do you get on with Miss Hender?' said Kate, 
partly from curiosity and half from a wish to change the conversation. "'Oh, pretty well,' said Ralph, with something that sounded, in spite of his wheezing, like a sigh. "'How does she manage the dressmaking? She was always a good workwoman, but she never had much taste, and I should fancy wouldn't be able to do much if left entirely to herself.' Oh, "'That's just what occurred. It's curious you should have guessed so correctly.' "'The business has all gone to the dogs, "'and since Mother's death we've turned the house into a lodging-house.' "'Oh, and is Mother dead?' cried Kate, clasping her hands. Oh, "'What must she have thought of me?' "'Ralph did not answer, but after a long silence he said, "'It's a pity, isn't it, that we didn't pull it off better together?' "'Kate raised her head and looked at him quickly. "'Her look was full of gratitude.' "'Yes,' she said, "'I behaved very badly towards you, "'but I believe I've been punished for it. "'He told me that he'd married you and treated you very well. "'Oh,' she said, bursting into tears, "'don't ask me. It's too long a story. "'I'll tell you another time, but not now.' "'It appeared to Kate that her heart was on fire "'and that she must die of grief. "'Was this life?' she asked herself. Oh, to be at rest and out of the way for ever! Ralph, too, seemed deeply affected. After a pause, he said, I don't know how it was or why, but now I come to think of it, I remember that I used to be cross with you. Oh, it was the asthma that made you cross, and well it might. And she asked him if he still suffered from asthma, and he answered, oh, At times, yes. Oh, but the cigarettes, she said, used to relieve you. Do you still smoke them? Yes, and sometimes they relieve me, and sometimes they don't. A long silence separated them, and breaking it suddenly, he said, There were faults on both sides, on every side, he added, for I don't exempt mother from blame either. She was always too hard on you. "'Now I should never have minded your going to the theatre and amusing yourself. "'I shouldn't have minded your being an actress, "'and I should have gone to fetch you home every evening.' "'Kate smiled through her misery, and he continued, following his idea to the end. "'It wouldn't have interfered with the business if you had been. "'On the contrary, it would have brought us a connection, "'and I might have had up those plate-glass windows and taken in the fruiterer's shop.' Ralph stopped. The roar of London had sunk out of hearing into the yellow depths of the fog, and for some minutes nothing was heard but the short ticking of the clock. It was a melancholy pleasure to dream what might have been had things only taken a different turn, and like children making mud pies, it amused them to rebuild the little fabric of their lives, while one reconstructed his vision of broken glass the other lamented over the ruins of penny journal sentiment. Then, awakening by fits and starts, each confided in the other. Ralph told Kate how Mrs. Ede had spoken of her when her flight had been discovered. Kate tried to explain that she was not as much to blame as might be imagined. Ralph's curiosity constantly got the better of him, and he couldn't but ask her to tell him something about her stage experience. One thing led to another, and before twelve o'clock it surprised her to think she had told him so much. The conversation was carried on in brief and broken phrases. The man and woman sat close together, shivering over the fire. There were no curtains to the windows, and the fog had crept through the sashes into the room. Kate coughed from time to time, a sharp, hacking cough, and Ralph's wheezing grew thicker in sound. "'I'm afraid I shall have a bad night, this dreadful weather. "'I should like to stop to nurse you, but I must be getting home.' "'Oh, you surely won't think of going out such a night as this. "'You'll never find your way home.' "'Oh, yes, yes, I shall. "'It wouldn't do for me to remain here.' "'They, who had once been husband and wife, "'looked at each other and both smiled painfully.' "'Very well. I'll see you downstairs.' "'Oh, no, you mustn't. You'll kill yourself.' Ralph, however, insisted. 
They stood on the doorstep for a moment together, suffocating in a sulphur-hued atmosphere. You'll come and see me again tomorrow, won't you? Oh, yes, yes, cried Kate. Tomorrow, tomorrow. And she disappeared into the darkness. End of chapter 29《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピー
with what you get from your husband you'd be better off than any of us but she could not be persuaded and as time moved on and drunkenness became more inveterate the belief that she was not utterly lost unless she was unfaithful to dick took possession of her and she clung to it with an almost desperate insistency saying to her friends if i were to do that i should go down to the river and drown myself she used to hear laughter when she said these words and the replies were that every woman had said the same thing but we all come to it sooner or later not me not me she replied tottering out of the public house but one night awakening in the dusk between daylight and dark she remembered that something had befallen her that had never befallen her before she was not sure it may have been that she had dreamed it all the same she could not rid herself of the idea that last night in the public house near charing cross a man had come in and said he would pay for the drinks and that afterwards she had gone to one of the hotels in villiers street if she hadn't why did she think of villiers street she rarely went down that street yet she was haunted by a memory a hateful memory that had kept her awake and had caused her to moan and to cry for hours till at last sleep fell upon her on waking her first thought was to inquire from the women and she walked up and down the strand seeking them till nightfall but they could tell her nothing of what had happened after she left them dry your eyes kate they said what matter your husband deserted you aren't you free to live with whom you please kate felt that all they said was true enough but she prayed that the memory of the hotel bedroom that had risen up in her mind was the memory of a dream and not of something that had befallen her in her waking senses it were bad enough that she should have dreamed such a thing and on returning home she fell on her knees and prayed that what she feared had been had not been and she rose from her knees her eyes full of tears and a sort of leaden despair in her heart that she felt would never pass away as the days went by her mind became denser she fell into obtusities out of which she found it difficult to rouse herself even her violent temper seemed to leave her and miserable and hopeless she rolled from one lodging to another drinking heavily bringing the drink back with her and drinking in her bed until her hand was too unsteady to pour out another glass of whisky she drank whisky brandy gin and if she couldn't get these any other spirit would serve her purpose even methylated spirit her bed curtains were taken away by the landlady lest kate should set them on fire the landlady lit the gas at nightfall and turned it out before she went to bed only in that way she said to herself can we be sure that that woman won't burn us all to death in our beds once a room is let she continued it's hard to turn a sick woman out especially if there's no excuse and in this case there's none for you see mrs lennox is getting two pounds a week from her husband mr locker mrs rawson's evening friend agreed with her and he spoke of the recompense she would be entitled to from mr lennox in the event of mrs lennox's death for of course every trouble and annoyance should be recompensed she agreed with him but her eyes suddenly softening she said i haven't seen her since this morning when i took her up a cup of tea she may like a bit of dinner we're having some rabbit for supper i'll ask her if she'd like a piece a few minutes later she returned saying she was afraid mrs lennox was dying and that it might be as well to send to the hospital locker answered that perhaps it would be just as well but on second thoughts he suggested that the husband should be communicated with it isn't far to the opera comique mrs rawson answered i'll just put on my hat and jacket and go round there it'll be the best way to escape responsibility locker said on the doorstep but without answering she went up the strand passing over to the other side when she came in sight of the globe theater where's the stage entrance of the opera comique she asked at the bookstall at the corner of hollywell street and was told that she would find the stage entrance in which street about halfway down the street the stage doors of the globe and the opera comique are side by side was cried after her what does he mean by halfway down the street she muttered he meant a quarter down 
and she addressed herself to the doorkeeper, who answered surlily that Mr. Lennox was particularly engaged at that moment. But at Mrs. Rawson's words, "'I believe his wife is dying,' he agreed to send up a message as soon as he could get hold of somebody to take it. At last somebody's dresser was stopped as he was about to pass through the swing door. He agreed to take the message, and a few minutes after Mrs. Rawson was conducted up several little staircases and down some passages to find herself eventually in a small room in which there were three people. One, a pleasant-faced man, so affable and kind that Mrs. Rawson thought she could have got on with him very well if she had had a chance. By him stood a tall, imperious lady who rustled a voluminous skirt. A person of importance, Mrs. Rawson judged her to be, from the deference with which a little thread-paper man listened to her. The costumier, she learned from scraps of conversation. "'I'm sorry,' Mr. Lennox said. "'All you tell me is very sad, but I'm afraid I can do nothing.' Oh, "'That's what I think myself,' Mrs. Rawson answered. "'I'm afraid there's nothing to be done, but I thought I'd better come and tell you.' You see, when I went up with some beef tea, she looked to me like one that hasn't many days to live. I may be mistaken, of course. She should have a nurse, Mrs. Forrest said. Oh, I do all I can for her, Mrs. Rawson murmured. But you see, with three children to look after and only one maid... The two women began to talk together, and the thread-paper man took advantage of the opportunity to whisper to Dick that he thought he could manage to do the flower-girl's dresses at five shillings less. "'That will be all right,' Dick replied. "'I will call round in the morning, Mr. Shaffle.' Mrs. Forrest held out her jacket to Dick, who helped her into it. "'Where are you going? Shall you be coming back again?' he asked. "'I'm going to nurse your wife, Dick.' she said, picking up her long feather boa. "'And isn't all that is happening now a vindication that we did well not to yield ourselves to ourselves? For had we done so, our regrets would be now unanimous, and I shouldn't be able to go to her with clear conscience.' "'She's been drinking heavily again, no doubt,' Mrs. Forrest said, turning to Mrs. Rawson. "'But we mustn't judge or condemn any one, so Jesus hath said.' "'I'll go with you now, Mrs. Rawson. "'And you'll perhaps come to-morrow, Dick, to see her?' "'If I could help my wife, I'd go, Laura. "'But as I've often told you, "'my will to help her was spent long ago. "'It would be of no use.' "'Laura's eyes lit up for a moment. "'But if she asks to see me, I'll go.' "'At these words Mrs. Forrest's eyes softened, and he began to ask himself how much truth there was in Laura's resolve to go and attend upon his wife in what was no doubt a last agony. Seeing and hearing her put into his head remembrances of an actress, he couldn't remember which. Her demeanour was as lofty as any, and her speech almost rose into blank verse at times, and he began to think that she had missed her vocation in life. It might have been that she was destined by nature for the stage. "'She's more mamma than myself or Kate,' he said to himself, and giving an ear to her outpourings, he recognised in them the rudiments of the grand style, and he admired her transitions. Her voice would drop, and she seemed to find her way back into homely speech. Her soul seemed to pass back and forwards easily, and Dick did not feel sure which was the real woman and which the fictitious.' "'She doesn't know herself,' he said, for at that moment she had left the tripod and was sitting in imagination at the bedside in attendance, looking from the patient to the clock, administering the medicine on the exact time. When Mrs. Rawson spoke about the length of the day and night, she answered that she would take her work with her, and bade Dick not to be anxious about the changes he had asked her to make in the second act. "'They shall be made,' she said, "'and without laying myself open to any claim for demurrage.' "'Demurrage!' Dick exclaimed. "'She shall have attendance, "'but a soul ready to depart "'shouldn't be detained in port longer than is necessary. "'And Mrs. Rawson would like to let her room "'to one who has not received her sailing orders, "'as is the case with your poor wife, Dick. "'That is to say, if I understand Mrs. Rawson's account of her illness.' 
"'Oh, she's not here for long,' Mrs. Rawson answered. "'Oh, but you mustn't think, ma'am, that I'd lay any under claim for the trouble she's been to me, only what is fair. Fair is fair all the world over, has been my maxim, ever since I started letting apartments. Uh, but perhaps, ma'am, you'll be wanting a room in my house. If you do, there's a drawing-room floor, which would suit you nicely. Oh, but you can't be day nurse and night nurse yourself.' Laura answered that that was true, and talking of a nurse from Charing Cross Hospital, they went out of the house together. At the end of the street, Laura stopped suddenly. "'But she must have a doctor,' she said, and waited for Mrs. Rawson to recommend one. And Mrs. Rawson replied that the doctor that attended her and her children was out of town. "'We will ask here,' Laura said, and called to the cabby to stop at the apothecary's and the question she put to the man behind the counter was so pertinent that Mrs. Rawson began to think that perhaps she had misjudged Mrs. Forrest, who now seemed to her a sensible and practical woman. They jumped again into a cab, and after a short drive returned with the doctor, Laura relating to him in the cab all they knew about his patient. "'From what you tell me, it seems a bad case,' he said, and turning from Laura to Mrs. Rawson, he asked her to describe the patient." "'When I took up the beef tea, I found her that bad "'that I felt I'd always have it on my conscience "'if I didn't let her husband know how bad his wife was. "'I'm afraid, Doctor, that she's been drinking for years,' Laura interjected. "'Well, as soon as I see Mrs. Lennox, "'I shall be able to tell you if there is, in my opinion, "'any reasonable hope of saving her. "'I believe you're going to nurse Mrs. Lennox through this illness?' "'he asked Laura.' and she began to tell him how she had always known of this duty. Years before she had ever met Mr. Lennox, it had been revealed to her. Not the exact time, but the fact that she would have to attend upon the wife of some man who would be engaged in the publication of some of her works. You see, her husband is producing my play Incarnation at the Opera Comique, and I brought some of my work with me. She opened her bag and laid on the table the manuscript entitled Sayings of the Sibyl, and the doctor listened, at first not satisfied that she was altogether the nurse into whose charge he would have liked to have given Mrs. Lennox, but feeling that if he were to press the necessity of a nurse on Mrs. Forrest she might leave, he refrained, thinking that very often people who talked eccentrically were very practical. He had known extravagant speech go with practical nursing, and hoping that Mrs. Forrest would prove another such one, he laid down the manuscript on the table. "'But if you believe that we live hereafter, why should you deny pre-existence?' And without waiting for the doctor to answer, Laura averred that she had lived at least eight times already, witnessing the dread contest of death and dying for the cause of Pan and the Light King and Eros the Immortal, whose I am, she said, and once again for the ninth time I live and watch the contest, watch with joy which overcomes fear, with love that conquers death. Well, I hope we shall be able to conquer death in this instance, the doctor answered, and with care we may save her for some time, and if— Ah, if, Laura interjected, and curtsying to him she led the doctor to the door. Nothing, she began, can be worse than the present state of earth life, and in all its phases. If the human race is to be evolved into a higher degree of perfection, no weak half-measures will avail to effect the change. There must, on the contrary, be a radical change in hereditary environment. The doctor listened a moment, and as if enchanted with the impression she had produced, Laura went back to the writing table, and settling the folds of her brown silk widely over the floor, she began to write. Ye gods, they fail, they falter, thy hand hath struck them down. Their woof the parquet altar. Beware thy mother's frown. What such as I in glory compared with such as thee would in the conflict gory that I had died for thee? At this point the inspiration seemed to desert her, and raising her pen from the paper she bit its end thoughtfully, 
seeking for a transitional phrase whereby she might be able to allude to the light god. They were in a six-shilling-a-week bedroom in the neighbourhood of the Strand. The window looked on to a bit of red-tiled roofing, a cistern, and a clothesline on which a petticoat flapped, and in a small iron bedstead facing the light, Kate lay delirious, her stomach enormously distended by dropsy. From time to time she waved her arms, now wasted to mere bones. She had been insensible for three whole days, speaking in broken phrases of her past life, of Mrs. Ede, the Potteries, the two little girls, Annie and Lizzie. Dick, she declared, had been very good to her. Ralph, too, had been kind, and she was determined that the two men shouldn't quarrel over her. They mustn't kill each other. She wouldn't allow it. They should be friends. They would all be friends yet. That is to say, if Mrs. Ede would permit of it. And why should she stand between people and make enemies of them? She fell back into stupor, and next day her ideas were still more confused. In the belief that it was for the part of the Bailey that Dick and Ralph were quarrelling, she began to express her regret that there was nothing in the piece for her. Nor were memories of the baby girl who had died in Manchester lacking. She prayed Ralph to believe that the child was not his, but Dick's child. She prayed and supplicated in Laura's arms till Laura laid her back on the pillow, exhausted. Oh, "'Give me something to drink. I'm dying of thirst,' the sick woman murmured faintly. Laura started from her reveries, and going over to the fireplace where the beef tea was standing— poured out half a cup, but owing to great difficulty in breathing it was some time before the patient could drink it. After a long silence, Kate said, I've been very ill, haven't I? I think I must be dying. Death is not death, Laura answered, when we die for Pan, the undying representative of the universe cognizable to the senses. Over Kate's mind lay a vague dream, through whose gloom two things were just perceptible, an idea of death and a desire to see Dick. But she was almost too weak to seek for words, and it was with great effort that she said, "'I don't remember who you are. I can think of nothing now, but I should like to see my husband once more. Could you fetch him? Is he here?' "'You've not been happy with him, I know, my sister, but I don't blame you. "'Your marriage was not a psychological union, "'and when marriage isn't that, woman cannot set her foot on the lowest temple of Eros.' Oh, "'I'm too ill to talk with you,' Kate replied. "'But I love my husband well, oh, too well. "'I keep all my little remembrances of him in that box.' Oh, they aren't much, not much, but I should like him to have them when I'm gone, so that he may know that I loved him to the last. Perhaps then he may forgive me. Will you let me see them? She looked at the packet of letters, kissed the crumpled calico rose, the button she had pulled off his coat in a drunken fit and preserved for love, and she even slipped on her wrist the last few pearls that remained of the chaplet she wore when they played at sweethearts in the lover's knot. But after the love tokens had been put back in the box, and Kate again asked Mrs. Forrest to bring Dick to her, she began to ramble in her speech, and to fancy herself in Hanley. The most diverse scenes were heaped together in the complex confusion of Kate's nightmare. The most opposed ideas were intermingled. At one moment she told the little girls, Annie and Lizzie, of the immorality of the conversations in the dressing-rooms of theatres— at another, she stopped the rehearsal of an opera bouffe to preach to the mummers, in phrases that were remembrances of the extemporaneous prayers in the Wesleyan Church, of the advantages of an earnest working religious life. It was like a costume ball, where chastity grinned from behind a mask that Vice was looking for, while Vice hid his nakedness in some of the robes that chastity had let fall. Thus, up and down, like dice thrown by demon players, were rattled the two lives, the double life that this weak woman had lived, and a point was reached where the two became one, when she began to sing her famous song, 
Look at me here, look at me there, alternately with the Wesleyan hymns. Sometimes in her delirium she even fitted the words of one on to the tune of the other. Still Laura took no notice, and her pen continued to scratch and scratch, till it occurred to her that although Dick's marriage had not been a psychological one, it might be as well that he should see his wife before she died, and having come to this conclusion suddenly, she put on her bonnet and left the house. The landlady brought in the lamp, placing it on the table, out of sight of the dying woman's eyes. A dreadful paleness had changed even the yellow of her face to an ashen tint. Her lips had disappeared, her eyes were dilated, and she tried to raise herself up in bed. Her withered arms were waved to and fro, and in the red gloom shed from the ill-smelling paraffin lamp, the large, dimly-seen folds of the bedclothes were tossed to and fro by the convulsions that agitated the whole body. Another hour passed away, marked by the cavernous breathing of the woman as she crept to the edge of death. At last there came a sigh, deeper and more prolonged, and with it she died. Soon after, before the corpse had grown cold, heavy steps were heard on the staircase, and Dick and Laura entered, one with a quantity of cockatoo-like flutterings, the other steadily, like a big and ponderous animal. At a glance they saw that all was over, and in silence they sat down, their hands resting on the table. The man spoke hesitatingly in awkward phrases of a happy release. The woman listened with a calm serenity that caused Dick to wonder. She would have liked to have said something concerning psychological marriages, but the appearance of the huge body beneath the bedclothes restrained her. He wished to say something nice and kind, but Laura's presence put everything out of his head, and so his ideas became more than ever broken and disjointed, his thoughts wandered, until at last, lifting his eyes from the manuscript on the table, he said, "'Have you finished the second act, dear?' End of chapter 30 End of A Mummer's Wife by George Moore Recording by Anne Fletcher, Hobart, Tasmania, 2021